Uh, oh, good evening, everyone. Let's call the meeting to order. Uh, before we start, I need to raise a quick notice. Uh, important note, the board meeting will be held in person under the current Open Public Meetings Act. In-person board meetings may be held without restrictions on capacity and without physical distancing requirements. However, a remote option must be made available. Under Governor Jay Inslee's Proclamation 20-05 and in accordance with the Washington State Secretary of Health's order, in-person attendees are required to wear face coverings. The board must ensure the requirements are followed as Proclamation 20-20 5.15 prohibits any governmental, commercial, or nonprofit entity or private party from allowing any individual to enter or remain indoor spaces under their control unless the individual is in compliance with the Secretary of Health's face covering order and any subsequent amendments. The remote meeting option continues to be available for those who do not wish to wear a face covering or do not feel comfortable attending in person. Those attending remotely may sign up to provide public comment using online an online form which will be accessible at 515 on the day of the meeting. Okay, if you would all rise and join me with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Mike. Yes, sir. I, I don't want I don't want the I don't want us to have to shut down the meeting, but there are some people that's obviously not wearing masks. OK, so again, please, if you guys are not having a mask. Please put your mask up again. We will have to shut the meeting down if people are not in compliance. OK, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, OK, the next on our agenda is special recognition National School Counseling Week. Dr. Tracy Pierce. I do want to just clarify for everyone that when you're speaking from the podium and no one's around you or speaking from that podium and no one's around you, it is allowable under LNI per our legal counsel for us to remove our masks. So with that, I'm happy to uh, have some recognition this evening. It is National School Counseling Week. And we have amazing, outstanding counselors here in Kennewick School District, and we are very uh, proud of our team and what they do for our students. So I have a proclamation to read um, from the um, from ASCA, which is the American Standard School. Counseling Association, School, School Counselor Association. Thank you. OK, the proclamation reads, whereas school counselors are employed in public and private schools to help students reach their full potential, and whereas school counselors are actively committed to helping students explore their abilities, strengths, interests, and talents, as these traits relate to career awareness and development, and whereas school counselors help parents focus on ways to further the educational, personal, and social growth of their children, and whereas school counselors work with teachers and other educators to help students explore their potential and set realistic goals for themselves, and whereas school counselors seek to identify and utilize community resources that can enhance and complement comprehensive school counseling programs and help students become productive members of society, and whereas comprehensive developmental school counseling programs are considered an integral part of the educational process that enables all students to achieve success in school, we hereby do proclaim February 7th through 11th, 2022, as National School Counseling Week. And again, just to take a moment to give a, a big round of applause for all of our awesome students. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. OK, next on the agenda is communication from parents, staff, and district residents. Uh, Again, the key here is the board welcomes comment from public during these regular business meetings. The first 30 minutes is reserved during the working meeting for board to listen to comments, input, and information. In accordance with the Open Public Meetings Act, the board is not allowed to discuss items that are not on the meeting agenda. As appropriate, the board will direct the superintendent to follow up on any items shared during public comment. Please note, it is, all, it is important for all community members to feel welcome and safe during the board's business meeting. 
The board does not take public comments on issues related to personal or individually named staff members or board at board meetings. However, you can email the board with any such comment. So quickly, we have more than 15 people signed up, so I will allow the extra people, but I would hope that everyone keeps their comments brief and to the point this evening, because otherwise we're going to run out of time. So again, we have 15, 60, 7, 18, 19, 20 people. All right. So if people start going over, I will stop. All right. So our first speaker tonight is uh, Dustin Peterson. All right, thank you. I'll be brief. So um, I just wanted to talk about the levy real quick. So I was one of the voters who voted yes on the technology levy and no on the operations levy. And uh, for me, it was really actually an easy decision for me. Um, the levy started out at 1.75 and went up to 2.35. That's a 34% increase. PASCO's levy that they proposed was 34% lower, and that one passed. And of course, the operations levy is failing right now. So. I just wanted to give feedback to the board of why I voted no. I thought this was a pretty steep increase at a time when enrollment is basically flat. Um, so I hope if you do go back to the board and you know put the levy back on the ballot, just consider putting the levy rate a little, little lower next time. So, um, and then also I'd like to talk about uh, the mandates real quick. I saw that uh, vaccine mandates were on the agenda. I just want to encourage the board to pass a uh, just like a resolution to um, you know where you stand on the issue because I think the community wants to know where you stand on that issue. It's a very important uh, topic right now across the country. If we could just kind of get you guys tell us where you stand on it and that kind of might clear up uh, where the community is or where you are with the community. So thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Marissa uh, Hammett. Sorry. <laughs> I'm Marissa Haverlug. I'm a student at Tenement High School, and uh, I was going to talk about the masks. Um, to me, masks haven't made a negative impact at all. Uh, they've allowed me to go back to in-person school, which has really helped my mental health. Uh, when we were online uh, last year, it was really hard not having that personal connection. So being allowed to be in, like, in person has helped a lot, and so I just want to say thank you for following the mask mandate and letting us have that. I also want to say thank you for um, being supportive when it comes to planning different events for our school, uh, such as homecoming and a Shakespeare in the Snow, which is a three-day overnight trip. Um, if you guys hadn't let us plan those things, then I know things would have turned out a lot differently. So just thank you for doing what you can for uh, keeping us safe. That's good. Thank you. Appreciate that. Wonderful. Our next speaker is Olivia Chambers. Good evening. My name is Olivia Chambers, and I'm a sophomore at Kennewick High School. I'm glad to be with you guys tonight. So during quarantine, my mental health took a turn for the worse. I suffer from bipolar 2 disorder, and so without being in person, my entire, like, everything boiled over. So now that we're back in school, my condition has improved and without your help, in-person learning wouldn't be possible. The mass help with my anxiety regarding the pandemic, I don't find them bothersome. They allow me to see my friends and classmates safely. As a student, I care about the safety of myself and my peers and Kennewick School District has fulfilled this need by maintaining the mass mandate. Thank you for making our district safer. Thank you, Olivia. Our next speaker is Janet Chavez. Hi, I'm, I'm Janet Chavez, ASB president at Kamikan High School. I'm heavily involved with student leadership and activities. Thank you, Kennewick School District, for keeping staff and my fellow peers safe. Thank you for making my last year as normal as the circumstances allow it. I know this year has been difficult for everyone, but keeping masks in place is one step forward towards norm normalcy. Without wearing masks, we run into the fear of going back to remote learning, which leads to a decrease of student involvement and creating a setback. Thank you, Kennewick School District, for keeping everyone safe. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jackson Clary. Um, 
obviously my name is Jackson Clary. I'm a student here at Kennewick High School. Um, I personally just believe a lot of this controversy over the masks is much overblown, and I don't believe many students at my school uh, agree with this. Um, personally, I believe that receiving state funding for uh, keeping up the mask mandate is much more important than anything that could be gained by the removal of this mandate. And I appreciate everything the board is doing to keep us safe and keep the schools open. And if something like that means we must uh, keep a mask mandate in force, then I am more than willing to abide by that. I just want to keep the schools open and anything we can do to keep that happening, I am 100% supportive. Thank you guys. Thank you. Uh, next speaker is Simran Math Matharu. How that is, I butcher your name, I'm sorry. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Simran Matharu and I attend Kennewick High School. Um, personally, the masks have not been a great issue for me or any of my fellow students here at Kennewick High um, that are here tonight. Um, I personally think that it, it has bettered our opportunity at school and it's made everything better and to be in person, has honestly made everything great. So to keep the masks and, and to, or sorry, to have the masks be available and for everything to be in person just makes mental health better, makes in-person school better, makes just the public opportunity to be with each other, just everything is better. So I thank my staff at Kennewick High and you guys as well. So thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Aurora Solis. My name is Aurora Solis. I'm a sophomore at Southridge High School and I run our Sons for Equity Club. I am in favor of masks inside of our schools. The entire purpose of our school board is to give all students a safe and equal learning environment, which is what they are fighting against. Being back in person learning is something I and many other students at Southridge are very grateful for. But it has to be done in a safe and protective way. In my family, we have multiple immunocompromised people, including my little brother, who's a student at Edison Elementary. He has autism and a weakened immune system as a result of the premature birth. Masks are essential for keeping him safe at school, and without them, he wouldn't be able to receive the learning environment that he needs. He wouldn't have access to the plethora of programs that being in person offers to him. Sorry. He also has sensory issues as a result of his autism, yet wearing a mask all day doesn't bother him one bit. When I go to school and see students without masks, it not only risks my health and my education, but it risks the health and education of my loved ones. As our school directors, your entire job and responsibility is to keep us safe while we learn, and I simply ask you to fulfill that, and that you not listen, that you listen to science and not the law. Thank you. Uh, next is Lindsay Linoff. says Linhoff or Linhoff, I'm sorry. Okay. I'm not going to be brief, but I will talk fast. My name is Lindsay Linhoff, and I've got kids at Eastgate Elementary, Horse Heaven Hills Middle School, and Southridge High Schools. I'm here today because I'm tired. I'm tired of seeing my kids come home from school feeling defeated and exhausted. I'm tired of asking them how their day went and hearing fine, followed by a heavy sigh. I'm tired of hearing their valid complaints about masking and arbitrary social distancing rules they are forced to follow. My kids have always loved school and used to come home excited to tell us all about it. Instead, what I'm hearing now is about their teachers telling them how guns are bad and masks are good, that girls can be boys and boys can be girls, and that the color of your skin actually matters. I want to be supportive of this board and I want to be supportive of the school district, but I am tired from sending my kids to school each day knowing the depressive circumstances they are dealing with. The suicide rate in teenage girls has spiked to 52% in the past year, but due to policies put in place to protect adults from diseases that had little to no effect on children, I will be damned if I allow my children to be part of that number, and I'm here today with a challenge for this board I challenge you to remember why over 200 years ago, our rights being threatened by a dictator across the ocean was no longer acceptable and why this country was formed as a democracy. I challenge you to reflect on the orders of Jay Inslee and to explain to me the ways he has protected our democracy. And I challenge you to ask yourself how much power our government would have without the people doing as we are told for fear of government recourse and remove this mask mandate on our children. I also challenge the parents who are here with me tonight to stand up for your kids. You are responsible for the health of your own children, whether that be physical or mental, and you cannot have one without the other. Each adult who chooses to can or has been vaccinated. It is our moral obligation as adults to protect our children, not the other way around. 
They are at a higher risk of dying from pneumonia than they ever were from COVID, which by the way, is being found in every single mask that is tested. I demand the school district return my parental rights to make health decisions that affect my children and remove the mask mandates immediately. It has also come to my attention that boys are being allowed to use the girls' restroom at Southridge High School. Whether school admin is aware of that or not is not known to me, but I look forward to the resolution of an investigation from this board. Thank you for your time, SBG for Life. Thank you. Our next speaker is David Hall. Hi, my name is David Hall and I'm a teacher. I just want to ask some questions. What will the history books record concerning the years 2020, 21, and 22? Will people who resisted and spoke out against mandates be shown to be brave and rational dissenters? Or will we see them as selfish and petty, overreacting to reasonable measures? How about the complicit ones? Will they be seen as team players doing their part in an historic pandemic? Or will they be seen as vectors by which tyranny advanced? All of this depends on what we do now. School boards have been the pinch point for much frustration, right or wrong. Our school board has stated exhaustively that their hands are tied, citing higher authority compels them. Meanwhile, in our schools and among our population, mental health and academic abilities have sharply declined. This statistic is undisputed. It, is no, lo it no longer suffices to blame this on COVID or the pandemic as a blank check by which every negative consequence gains acceptance. It was our response to this new strain of the cold and flu that has brought these consequences and nothing else. We thought people could not make beneficial choices about their own health and look where it's gotten us. We thought the power of government was necessary to force sense into people for one reason. We thought you were too stupid to assess risk for yourself. Then wearing a mask and getting a shot were universally praised as the path to normal, a quote, normal life or normal day became the carrot dangled on a rope to students and parents. Was this the false incentive that enabled emergency powers for 711 days and counting? Our next steps must be taken with utmost care because we adults have lost all credibility with the next generation. Let's give them back their faces, give them back their lives with no strings attached. But when mandates are lifted, by what standard will students who are still afraid to have a naked nose be convinced otherwise? We can't unring the bell. Actual tolerance and actual diversity must be practiced with kindness and patience, because what does the phrase trust the science mean now? So if you've ever wondered what you would be doing in a defining moment in history, you're doing it right now. Thanks. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jared Bloxham. My name is Jared Bloxham. I'm a father of four. My youngest child is a sophomore at Kenwick School District High School. My wife is an employee of KSD as a special education paraeducator at a KSD high school. We have a tendency to label ourselves. I am most proud to wear the label of father and husband. I am also proud to wear the label of doctor. I am an oral medicine and orofacial pain specialist. I have 11 years of youth university training at the highest levels that include epidemiology, immunology, and virology. I have 19 years of practice where infection control is an important aspect of every care of care and every patient I see. I acknowledge that the COVID pandemic has been very serious and I have lost close personal friends to it. I do not speak of it lightly or without great risk introspect and research. Nearly every patient that is in my care deals with chronic pain and chronic health problems. This comes with significant emotional and psychological effect. The converse is also true. Compromised emotional and psychological health contributes significantly to physical pain and poor health. I am trained to recognize and address these effects in order to improve the physical, mental, and emotional health of my patients. My wife and I are very involved with the youth in KSD. We see these kids every day and we love them and care about their well-being. I hope as educators and board members that you likewise interact closely with our youth and are mindful of their physical and psychological health. You cannot have one without the other. We would all be ignorant if we failed to recognize the emotional and psychological effects that continuing to enforce unnecessary mandates has had on many of these kids. I see it in my home, I see it at our schools, I see it in my practice. The psychological effects have been increasing in both severity and frequency at an alarming rate. Country after country, state after state, and school after school board has recognized this and acted accordingly by lifting these mandates. If the serious health threat to our children by the pandemic came close to the severity of the mental health crisis we are now erroneously imposing upon them, I would be one of the greatest proponents. 
The science is increasingly clear that they are unnecessary and causing more harm than benefit for many of these kids. In healthcare, if a treatment causes more harm than benefit, it is abandoned. It is time to abandon the mandates for these students. Let it be a choice. For many, that means that the choice to wear a mask relieves the fear that we all recognize and have probably felt at some point during the pandemic due to uncertainty and the threat of sickness. For many, that means the choice not to wear one due to the very real psychological and emotional effects it has imposed. Your fear dictating your choice to wear a mask is no, more, no greater, nor more real than theirs that dictates their choice to oppose it. Your fear is not more important than theirs. Mr. Bloxham, your time is Your choice is right for you. Let their choice be right for them. The science dictates that neither of you are wrong. Mr. Stop Bloxham, this nonsense. Your time is up. I acknowledge that masking is initially an appropriate knee-jerk reaction. Mr. Bloxham, your Unmask time is Unmask our kids up. and let's work to restore the social, emotional, and psychological health and mental health of this highly compromised demographic. Okay. Our next speaker is Marianne Bloxham. I would like to start that I financially do not need to work, but do so because I love, <clears throat> I have a love for the students in my school. I am at my limit. I can say that everything that has been happening has made my job something I dread to go to. I have noticed that speaking out for my daughter and other students will continue to put a target on my back for the people who disagree and think I'm attacking them. This is not about attacking teachers or anyone else. This is about trying to turn a wrong back into a right. It's about trying to see it from their point of view without treating them like they are troublemakers or delinquents. I will not pretend that wearing a mask is normal. I will not pretend that being able to see a smile on somebody's face isn't normal. I will not pretend that test scores and grades do not continue to decline. I will not pretend that wearing a mask does not disconnect, cause a disconnect with students and then cause a dis, it causes a learning issue. I will not pretend that it is okay to kick a student out of class because they are considered a health risk for not wearing a mask. I will not pretend that the way they are going about things is not causing anxiety and depression among our youth and adults. I will not pretend that enforcing masks in the way that we have is not contributing to the anxiety. I will not pretend that wearing a mask it's not a safety issue by not being able to recognize a student's face in case of an emergency, especially after two lockdowns and a shooting in Richland two days ago. I will not pretend that going through the day wearing a mask is not hard and sometimes I need mask breaks. I will not pretend that mental health issues have not skyrocketed in our youth these past two years. I will not pretend my discussions with pediatricians on how they are having to prescribe more antidepressants to our youth and children is not a big issue. I will not pretend these things I have mentioned because I've lost two siblings to suicide. Mental health is important to me and the safety of our children goes far beyond the danger that COVID is to them. I ask you to quit ignoring pretending these issues do not exist. They are experiencing more dangers with than without a mask. Wearing a mask should be a choice, not a requirement. I ask you please be the voice of NR district for the change that is needed. I ask you to call our state leaders the, and communicate with them what your community is asking. This is a fight that staff should not be having to have. Enforcing masks was never part of our job description. Thank you. The next speaker is Bailey Bloxham. Hi, my name is Bailey Bloxham. I am a student at Southridge High School. I am speaking to you for the second year in a row of concerns of students that no one is listening to. Why is it okay for teachers, staff, and students to bully and harass those of us that don't wear a mask or wear it below and nothing is done about it? Why is it that masks are more important than our learning and mental health? Why do we have to feel not comfortable in a school that we're supposed to feel safe in? I have been home for two entire days, both before school has even started and kicked out of class once for having my mask below my chin. My friend was suspended today for five days for not pulling his mask up yesterday. And those of us who have had our masks down or have taken it off have experienced bullying and harassment from teachers, staff, students, and administration. We get dirty looks in the hallways. The way they talk to us is different than the way they did before. We have even been told since we have been sent home before, we spark their attention. 
They only target those of us that have been sent home before. In the classrooms, there are many students around us that have their masks just like ours or lower. But we get in trouble because we've been sent home. Why can't I just learn and get my education? We're healthy students, but we're treated as if we have a disease. If I get in trouble if I have my mask even down, even when I'm having an anxiety attack. But all they care about is my mask. Not my mental health or how I'm feeling, not whether or not I can breathe or if I can learn properly with my mask on. We can't understand what our teachers are teaching or saying. It seems that they just send us home because they don't want to deal with us. We've always been told school is where everyone belongs, so why don't we? Our education, our education system is now more broken than ever. How do you plan on fixing it? Thank you. Our next speaker is Kason Spinney. Hey, excuse me, Mike. We're having a little issue back here in the back row. What's the matter? Thank you. I think that's yeah, what back row here. They decided they're going to make remarks over all the people that are against math. We've been very courteous to them when they spoke. We expect the same from them. We and they you, can either you, be courteous and quit making their sir, side I, remarks, especially to the doctor. They made, they made side remarks, gave him dirty looks. They can either leave or they can be courteous. Sir, they. You are correct. We, we, we expect everyone here to behave in a professional and kind manner. That goes for everyone here. Please. All right. Casey. Good evening. My name is Casey Spinney, and I'm a. We, yeah, they're still going on in the back. Because, yeah, yeah we. Sir, sir, we're no. going to shut it down if you don't stop. And if all you guys don't stop, I'm going to make a motion to shut this down. Please abide by the opening comment that the president. I'm sorry. That, no, you're, you're, you're singing my tune. You're all good. So please, we want to get through this just like you do. Please. Do, it, I'm going to shut it down. I'm going to shut it down if we can't, can't live with each other. You don't even supposed to is, talk. This is not public comment time. Right. The only person speaking is the person that might have Casey, what was your last name? Spinney. Spinney? Correct. Am I going to go, Mr. Connors? You may, please. Good evening. My name is Casey Spinney, and I'm a student at Kamiken High School. Before I begin, I would like to respectfully acknowledge that this meeting is being held on the traditional lands of the Palouse, Cayuse, Walla Walla, and Umatilla peoples. <laughs> I make this acknowledgement as a first step in fulfilling everyone's responsibility in the Kennewick School District to critically look at colonial histories and present day implications as we pay respect for the keepers of the land and the land itself. My message is simple. Wearing a mask does not hinder my ability to learn, nor am I being oppressed for having to wear one for long periods of time. Please continue to enforce masks and listen to the scientists and our government and don't gamble with the 200 plus million dollars given to us from the federal and state government. And please continue to offer vaccinations for students as, as it's one of the most effective ways at keeping my peers, teachers, and family safe and our schools open. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Our next speaker is McKenna Blossom. Good evening, my name is McKenna Bloxham. You heard from me at the last board meeting and I want my voice to be heard again. I am a product of the Kennewick School District. I am a product of the bullying I faced in the Kennewick School District elementary through high school. I am a product of being the fat kid. The bullying I faced through my schooling helped to shape me into part of the person I am today, but I will not thank anyone for that. One thing I can say I gained through my experience was a voice. I refuse to stand back and be a bystander that so many face today, to the bullying so many face today. Because I am no longer in the school system, I can only speak of my experience and the experience of my sister and her friends that have shared their story with me. I've watched over the last few weeks as my sister has come home in tears because of how she has been treated. She has been targeted by not only her peers, but by teachers and administrators that she has been told she can trust. They pick her out of the crowd for doing the same thing countless others are doing and embarrass and harass her in front of her peers. How are students supposed to think that bullying isn't okay if they see adults that are supposed to be role models doing that exact thing? Accountability needs to be had. 
I'm tired of watching kids have to endure the harassment and bullying from those they are supposed to trust. I will use the voice I have gained to make sure that although I am not in a position of power like you board members are, my voice is being heard and I am not acting as a bystander. My perspective has been limited to that of Southridge High School as that is where I attended, my sister attends, and many of her friends attend. I listened to videos of an assistant principal yell, belittle, and incite fear into a group of students, my 15-year-old sister included. Watched a video that went viral of a teacher getting into a physical altercation with a student while another student tells him he should not be doing that as a teacher. I've held back anger and disappointment as my sister tells me about being called out by teachers I know and once respected in front of her classmates and made an example of just because they feel like it and it's easy to target her. None of these things are okay. Are okay. What are we teaching our students in the district by doing nothing about these staff members bullying students? I know my sister is not alone in these instances. There has to be much more than what I'm just hearing about going on. By not ad addressing the problem and by standing by, as you're made aware of these situations, you are just as guilty as every one of those staff members. I ask the same questions and make the same plea I made last meeting. Show the students you truly do care and that being a, a member of the school, the school board isn't just something you're doing to add to a list of accomplishments. Show them you're doing it because you care for their well-being. Your Ms. job Watson, is to advocate for the best interests of the students. Put them first, show them you do not agree with this form of treatment and that you believe that the staff should not be able to mistreat students. If you do nothing, you're part of the problem. Thank you. Our next speaker is Annette Rose. None of the vaccines being administered in the U.S. are FDA approved. No one in the U.S. that has received the COVID vaccine has received an FDA approved shot. The FDA has asked for 75 years to disclose the safety data to the U.S. Please think about that statement. Why are we even having a conversation about mandating a substance that the safety data has not been released for? Besides the fact that the vaccine does not stop transmission or infection, these vaccines have epically failed. This discussion should be over. Dr. Robert Malone, inventor of mRNA vaccine technology says, mandating the vaccine makes no sense. It is completely inconsistent with the core principles of Western bioethics developed since the Nuremberg trials and codified in federal law. Dr. Aaron Curie says the safety and efficacy data still remains hidden. Dr. Ryan Cole says there is a false construct from our federal agencies that this is a pandemic and the unvaccinated are spreading it. That is a pathophysiological, uh, I knew I was gonna mess up that word, pathophysiological lie. Dr. Peter McCullough, who has more published studies than any other doctor in the world, says nobody can tell you the long-term safety profile of these vaccines. It's unknowable because nobody knows. We haven't taken the time. We, haven't see, we have seen unprecedented athletes dying on fields in Europe. Half of them will never come back. We do not know the effects these vaccines have on fertility of young girls. We do know that in rats, the vaccines attack their ovaries. Shouldn't we know these answers to these questions before we start injecting them in our children? There's a significantly underreported system as of today shows over a million adverse events, over 23,000 deaths, hospitalizations, 124,000, urgent care visits, 116,000, doctor's office visits, 169,000, anaphylaxis, 9,000, Bell's palsy, 14,000, miscarriages, 4,000, heart attacks, 12,000, myocarditis, 31,000, permanently disabled, 41,000, blood clots, 6,000, life-threatening instances, 26,000, severe allergic reactions, 39,000. Dr. McCullough also says, usually a safety trial for a vaccine takes somewhere between five to 10 years, not six months. The bottom line is for a large amount of people who do take these vaccines, they appear to work well. But there is a massive number of people who these vaccines cause adverse reactions and many of them have died. The CDC is saying almost 25,000 deaths. The EU reports close to 40,000. The UK has recorded tens of thousands. This vaccine causes deaths and it shouldn't. We should not have a vaccine that, that death is predictable. This vaccine has epically failed. There is no reason for the mandate. There is no basis for the mandate. The vaccinated and the unvaccinated are harboring similar viral loads. Why would it be mandated? It makes no sense. There is no scientific medical basis other than power that these mandates are based on. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jennifer Heldman. Jennifer Hildman. I'm Hildman. a teacher here in Kennewick and a community member. I have more to say than the two minutes, so I'm going to go quick, but I gave you a handout. TSD's mission is to provide a safe environment in which every student reaches their highest potential and graduates well, well prepared for success in post-secondary education work and life. That's on our district website. I listened to these KSD students last week, believe it or not, speak, and I was so unbelievably proud of them. 
For 30 years, I have tried to teach my students to be their own best resource, think critically, question and research to find the facts before forming their opinion. Never settle for mediocrity, and that integrity matters because I believe that is what the purpose of education is all about. That is why all of us are here, or at least I hope so. Needless to say, I was extremely disappointed to hear that these students' communication skills and their training were condemned and questioned by some in attendance during the last board meeting. I would be just as proud, and I am today, because there weren't any students last with them that went to the math, or for masks, and I'm just as proud of them too, because that's what we're here for. Since then, I couldn't quit thinking that our priorities in the last years, even prior to COVID, have gone away from our mission and what is best for our kids. Yes, COVID has had an impact. However, many of these issues existed pre-COVID. Bigger question now is what are we doing about it? Right now, we're sticking to the grade level curriculum expectations like we haven't missed a beat. Yet so much has been missed in the last two years for these kids. Kinders who didn't go to preschool and learn those social emotional skills learn. First graders who started out school behind a computer, sometimes with little or no support because parents were working to provide for their families. I could go on, but I think you get the picture. At what point do we as a district and even at each individual school say, we need to do what's best for our kids specifically here in Kennewick and get them up to grade level in reading, writing, and math. The rest is not important without those basics. When do we decide that we won't settle for mediocrity and quit looking at our current situation that it is what it is, do the best you can, just push kids through. COVID has actually given us the opportunity to think outside the box and focus on the needs of our kids here in Kennewick and do what is necessary. Two final thoughts. America is a federal republic, which is an indirect democracy, powering the people. Kids, do not ever forget that, please. And please, keep letting your voice be heard respectfully and responsibly. Ms. Feldman, your time is up. One last thing. School boards are to make that connection. If school boards go to is our hands are tied by the state, why do we have school boards? Thank you. Next speaker is Jojo Davis. Hi, everybody. It's time for your monthly Highlands updates. Um, I wanted to keep it positive, you know, in the world that is so dark and angry. I just feel like, and I kind of put a call out on my Facebook, I wanted staff and parents and students to come and let you know all the great things. Gabe, I went to your Facebook and I said, Gabe, you went to these schools. What's the positive stuff that you've seen? And I appreciate your response. There's so many things that you have no control over, but some one big thing that you do have control over, I'm coming to beg you. You know, I talked about um, just poverty. I talked about some of the struggles that our kids have. One of the things that I'm just begging you to do is look at what you can do economically for our students. You know, at Highlands, we, we can't get a PTO, even pre-COVID, we couldn't get parents to come. They are economically strapped. We have Desert Hills at one short little time, they raised $40,000 for their ASB. $40,000, are you kidding me? They don't have to refurbish football helmets. We can't afford to refurbish our helmets. Good God almighty, stop making school boundaries based on neighborhoods. Give every school economic chance. Give each one of us one rich doctor in our neighborhoods. Every time you create these schools, you spread the money out. Go back to when Horse Heaven Hills was built. Park and Highlands decimated. Oh, great that we have Ridgeview, Lincoln decimated. You take money out of our schools. Every time you build beautiful schools, people with money take their kids there. <laughs> We have great kids, but we have kids of color. We have kids of poverty. Don't just visit our schools. Play at recess with them. Play on the courts with them. Talk to them about skin color matters. Don't ever say to our kids, skin color doesn't matter. You talk about bullying, I, I'm sorry. You talk about bullying and all that other, other stuff. We can take these off as soon as Inslee gives us permission. Ron Mabry will always be black. He can't take that off. We can take these off. Thank you, See you next month. I'll try and be a little more positive. Maybe not. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, next speaker is Amanda Brown. 
Amanda Brown. That's great. Okay. Good evening, members of the board, President Connors, Superintendent Pierce. Um, I wanted to speak about the sub shortage that is um, happening across the nation, but we are really feeling it here in Kenwick School District. And I want to be clear that my comments are not related to COVID and the pandemic because the sub shortage was a phenomenon before the pandemic and before quarantine and before we had to wear masks and before the mandates. So um, I noticed that sub pay has gone up by $10 per day recently, which I really appreciate because subs need to be paid more. Um, right now with a sub pay at $145 a day, that gives them $19.33 an hour. If they were to work all 180 days of the school year, um, which they're not full-time employees, that but that would give them a $26,000 a year salary. Um, a first-year teacher coming in with a bachelor's degree and um, no experience gets $51,000 a year. So when uh, at per hour, that makes that $37 an hour. When an elementary school, for example, um, a specialist is pulled in order to cover a class, a teacher is paid for that time that they are contracted to have for free time. So they're paid for that time that they're working and have the kids in their class. So a first year teacher, that would be around $30. Um, and meanwhile, we're paying subs $19 an hour. So can we afford to pay subs more so we're not paying more to teachers who are covering in their classrooms? Um, also, there was recently an extra um, stipend or extra pace for teachers who are covering. I haven't had specials. I haven't had a regular week in a very, very long time. My kids went to PE for the first time in three months last Friday. They haven't been to technology since November. And um, there, I, I know my time is up and I just want to advocate for higher sub pay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next speaker is Jolene. I can't. I can't read the last Sundry. name. Thank you. Jolene Sundry. Hi, I'm a mother of two boys in the Kennewick School District. Both of my boys have had COVID. It was like a mild cold for them. I understand that's not the case for everyone, but that was the case for them. I see no reason whatsoever that I need to vaccinate my two boys they are at very low risk for any complications from COVID and they've had it. Um, I am here to ask the district to not mandate this vaccine. Annette Rose gave a beautiful rendition of all of the risks, side effects, um, and deaths that we're seeing from this vaccine. If parents want to vaccinate their children, that should be their choice. If parents do not want to vaccinate their children, that should be their choice. I want the right to choose whether I vaccinate my child or not. I will withdraw my students from Kennewick School District if this vaccine is mandated. I know many parents who feel the same. I have a question. If children are coerced into getting this vaccine or parents are coerced into vaccinating their children and they do have side effects, potentially lethal side effects, who is responsible for that? If the district has mandated that, who will be responsible for those children's medical issues or potential death? Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Deb Paku. Good evening. Hi. Ron, I have been mistaken for being black my whole life and it never mattered to me. Good job. Um, <laughs> I'm a Kamaikan mom, and I think it's incredibly, this isn't what I was going to say originally, but 
I have to say, I think it's incredibly sad to hear these kids. Thank you for keeping them safe and thank you for keeping their schools open. These are some of the brightest kids in our school. I know of them. A kid is more likely to die from a strike of lightning than from COVID. No one's keeping you safe, okay? A strike of lightning. And, and Kaysen, did you know that to correctly wear an N95 mask, you need to switch it out every 45 minutes and have it perfectly sealed? I, I don't want to stop you, but we clearly cannot talk to or address someone and, and call them by name, please. Sorry, please. That's okay. I'm sorry. That's okay. These are, it's just my heart goes out to these kids. Sure. I feel like they've been enveloped in fear over the past two years. And because all of their authority figures are all echoing the same lines, the same lines that we know with these studies can be completely broken down but no one is doing that for them. They go to school and their science teachers are wearing cloth masks. It doesn't make any sense. They're not being taught science. We're allowed to come up here and speak into this microphone without a mask. Why? This is probably the germiest thing in this room. I literally could catch something from this microphone. And I'm sure these kids thought nothing of it because they just don't know, and that's not okay. Your job and our jobs at home is to teach them real things. Why are we not teaching them real science so that they understand germ theory? That is covered in high school. Or the immune system, that also could be covered in high school. And the fact that these are not actually vaccines out right now that we're talking about, they're an emergency use medical experiment. And we don't have any proof that it helps anyone. But funny, Peckling, we have a lot of, sorry, we have a lot of anecdotes that it's killing people. Please kids, please look into that, please. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Katie Anderson. Excuse me, put your mask on and we're gonna have to shut it down. Thank you. Thank you, appreciate it. I really do appreciate it. Point of clarification, in order to shut it down, there needs to be a motion and a second, right? You don't need to say that. That is correct. You, that is correct. Yes. 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 That's what I mean. I'll make the motion. Sorry. What, Katie. What was, what was yes, Katie. Katie. Anderson. Anderson. Thank you for pointing that out. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Katie Anderson. I am a sophomore at Kamiakin High School, and I have been protesting for about two months now. Only recently did it become a problem. I'm protesting the mask mandate and to get freedom of choice back for all the students at Kamiakin and in the Kennewick School District. I have been kicked out of three of my classes at Kamiakin. I know others who have been kicked out as well. And the teachers who recently began selective enforcement have become math police, not teachers. What is a teacher? Their job is to teach my peers and I not decide how we protect our health. We should no longer assume everyone is sick and force masks to protect your community. It is not my responsibility to make sure my peers are taking care of their health. My health is not their problem. We should have choice in how we protect ourselves. I'm a student with one responsibility, to listen and learn the subjects being taught. The past week has shown me that my mask is the most important part of being a student. We have a mandate that says we are required to wear a mask in the school buildings. This mandate is not a law. A law is made by elective, elected representatives from every part of the state, not some unelected public health official or the executive branch only. As citizens in this country, our First Amendment right is this. Freedom of speech, peaceably to assemble, and to petition the government for redress of grievances. My peers are terrified not of my maskless face, but of the consequences of protests beyond the bullying, harassment, intimidation, and discrimination from the staff. The psychological harm is clear when I hear peers say that they feel embarrassed to show their face in public. These masks have made self-confidence levels in students drop significantly. Several of the teachers and staff members have said that they admire me for standing up. I refuse to listen to this again. If they really do admire me, they will stand up with me. Just this past Friday, I attended a varsity basketball game at Kamaikan High School. When I arrived, I noticed that about 75% of the people watching the game weren't wearing masks 
or we're wearing them incorrectly, including some of our teachers. Clearly, the school prioritizes sports attendance over being in class for an education. Ms. Anderson, I'm, your time's up. One second. I'm wearing this sweatshirt that my parents and I decided to make. It says, the only tired I was was tired of giving in, spoken by Rosa Parks herself. This quote encouraged me to stand my ground, not give up, and to be heard by the people. Hopefully, my fellow Kamayakin <laughs> Braves will have the courage to stand up for themselves with me. But if not, I've got their back and will support them always. Thank you. Our next speaker is Tina Gregory. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Thank you for all your hard work. I'm here to talk about the unlawful mask mandate. I've sent lots of outside peer reviews to prove they are dangerous. They cause psychological and physical damage. CO2 is dangerous to breathe. Our bodies are designed to breathe fresh air. Not all, not a petri dish of germs held in by a mask. John Hopkins' recent study shows that lockdowns and masks haven't done any good for us. Have any of you ever wore an N95 and sanded drywall? If so, what were your nostrils looking like? Mine are all caked. The virus is one micron. All of our masks are 60 to 80 microns. This is like trying to stop a fly with a chain link fence. Masks don't work. I would like to know if any of you ever see these masks on. Do you want them for the rest of our lives? In 1918, flu epidemic public health leaders studied and wrote the wearing of masks should be required in hospitals and for all who are directly exposed to the infection. The evidence proved the enforcing wearing of masks by the entire population at all times was contradictory and did not encourage the general public enforcement. Masks become wet with saliva, soiled with fingers, and aren't changed enough, leading to infection rather than prevention. Surgeon General of the U.S. Navy acknowledged that masks may have only prevented the infection from a direct close hit from a cough or a sneeze of an infected patient. The infection rate was higher among those who wore masks than those who did not. We need to remember history. Again, masks don't work. They are inhumane and abusive. If anyone believes they work, then they can wear them. I want to know how much money does the state provide? What is the slavery price for our children? Our governor and our school administrations haven't listened. I'm putting you all on notice. We the majority have had it. The world has had it. We want to see truth and proof. We don't believe the Center for Deception and Control or lying Fauci. Stop holding our children prisoners to your fears. They are 99.999 survivable. New Jersey, Connecticut, Delaware, Oregon, Colorado have stopped mandates. We're calling on you to be on the right side of history. And oh Lord, have mercy on us. Thank you. Uh, next speaker is Rachel Sambano. Rachel Sambrano. So I'm going to set up another air monitor for you. And this air monitor, it actually goes up to 10,000 parts per million. And remember, the workplace exposure limits are only 5,000 parts per million. My helper here is going to count out the second or count out the parts per million as it goes up while I count seconds. One one thousand, two one thousand, three one thousand, four one thousand, five one thousand, six one thousand, seven one thousand, eight one thousand, nine one thousand, ten one thousand, eleven one thousand, twelve one thousand. 13, 1,000, 14, 1,000, 15, 1,000, 
18, 1,000. 84, 90. 19, 1,000. 20, 1,000. 21, 1,000. 10,000. So I just wanted to let you know that this is an outside peer review for you, that we're breathing bad air with this mask on. So I just wanted to have it on record. Thank you. Mr. Cohn, do we have any online speakers? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for your input. Okay, next on our agenda is the consent items. I move to approve the consent items as written. I'll second it. I have a first and a second. Uh, Patty, can you get the roll call vote, please? Mr. Galbraith? Yes. Mr. Valentine? Yes. Ms. Senvik? Yes. Mr. Mabry? Yes. Mr. Connors? Yes. Thank you. Wonderful. Next is the superintendent board member reports. Uh, Dr. Pierce, would you like to lead us off? some very encouraging announcements coming from the state this week regarding a timeline for lifting the state mask mandate. And I'm going to share all of that information during the COVID-19 update and report and board discussion portion of the meeting. So I truly hope that, uh, you know, we heard from many uh, speakers tonight and I truly hope that people stay to hear the most updated information and the board discussion. Uh, I'm going to keep that uh, until that portion of the meeting. Um, I did want to share some other timely uh, information. Of course, as a district right now, we're very focused on the levy election that occurred yesterday. On election night, uh, preliminary results showed that the replacement levy for educational programs and operations right now is uh, not passing. Um, last night, the yes percentage was 48.39%. Uh, it requires a 50% a simple majority plus one vote to pass. The no vote is at 51.61%. Again, that was last night, and then I'll get to what today's update is. Um, the replacement levy for instructional technology improvements is passing. Uh, last night, the preliminary result was 51.81% passing, uh, yes votes, and 48.19% no vote. Again, that's a simple majority required 50% plus one vote. So um, the results are updated every night uh, at around five, between four and five, and um, will continue to be updated until uh, validation day, until the election is validated, which is February 18th. Uh, tonight's results showed the yes for uh, the re Placement EPO levy at 48.52%. Uh, so it's up a, a smidgen, I guess, <laughs> since yesterday. Um, we would need 1.48% um, to get to that 50. The no vote is at 51.48%. Uh, Replacement tech levy is now um, at yes with 51.92%. So that is up. Uh, slightly as well and with the no at 48%. So we'll continue to monitor the levy uh, returns and results daily. And uh, based on the final outcome of the election, I of course will be working with staff and the board um, to determine next steps once we know what that final outcome is. We'll probably know by uh, early next week we'll be able to see what the trend is. Uh, we don't necessarily have to wait until that February 18th validation day, we'll, we'll know. So um, that's just a brief update on, on where we are with the levy. I, I do want to share a few um, other updates that pertain to our students who continue to be our most important people. I want to share that as a district, we are continuing to remain deeply committed. All of our staff, all of our administrators, our counselors, our paraeducators, every single one of us, all this team here at the district office 
and myself, uh, we are very deeply committed to providing for the academic and social emotional well being of our students. Uh, we are committed to our goals for all students. Those are for all students, all students to be safe, known and valued, engaged learners and ready for their future. And that's why we're here. Uh, when it comes to the social emotional well being of students, we've heard it uh, for, you know, in different ways from different people. We know that these past two years have been extraordinarily difficult um, for many students, and we've shared uh, previously that this year we are contracting with Comprehensive Healthcare to provide uh, mental health therapists at our comprehensive high schools and um, split between our smaller choice schools as well. Um, we have been working with Comprehensive Health to add some additional uh, people as soon as they could provide the staff. And so we're working to finalize that right now to add some positions to also be able to support middle school students and, and students who are in need. We're also looking at potential options for providing a, an option for teletherapy, um, which, you know, uh, right now therapists are in high demand and short supply. And so when we can look at a teletherapy option, we might be able to tap into uh, people who live in different uh, parts of the state and um, or potentially country and um, provide an opportunity for some remote teletherapy too, because we, we know that um, we have students who are hurting and struggling and we wanna provide for them. We are using ESSER dollars, those one-time COVID dollars that we're getting from the federal government uh, for helping us get through this whole situation. So that's how we're funding those positions and would fund the expansion. We're also using ESSER dollars, of course, to provide for additional academic supports for students. So one way we've uh, done that is to ensure that even though enrollment is has declined over what it was before, we haven't declined staff because the more staff we have, the more pairs we have, the more teachers we have, class sizes can be smaller, uh, more people, more adults are there in the system to help support the students. So that's one thing that we're doing. And then earlier this week, we announced that we're providing all families with students in grades four through 12, the opportunity to access free tutoring, it's free to the family, it's a cost to the district, of course, um, through a partnership with Varsity Tutors. And again, this is a, a remote kind of tele um, tutoring option. Uh, so it can be provided at a time and place that's convenient for the family and the student after school, adding to the supports that are provided during school. So I wanna just make a note of that. All of our schools are working really hard. They're looking at the data, um, their student, uh, both the qualitative, the survey data that we do each year, our district survey, um, also all of the map data, the classroom assessment data, SBA data, all of the academic data that we look at, um, you know, classroom completion, all of those kinds of things to figure out what do we need to do to put additional supports for students? How do we strengthen the universal supports that are there for all students? And then how do we strengthen and target uh, additional intervention and support for the students who need it? So all of our schools have been working, um, continue to, to do that. They did it before COVID and they continue to do it now. And schools are also looking at developing and expanding their after school kind of offerings as well. And then again, this summer, like we did last summer, we really did an expansion of summer school. Uh, we put a STEM focus on summer school and really looked to, to help to make it be um, exciting and fun and engaging for students. And we're gonna do that again this year. And uh, so I just wanted to highlight those, but then loop back to the tutoring opportunity. So adding to the things that we're doing, we're now providing all families with the opportunity to access high dosage real-time remote tutoring, uh, which is a, a best practice, um, a promising practice that's being talked about really all over the country, this uh, idea of high dosage tutoring. It's for students in grades four through 12, uh, because those younger students, um, it's a little more challenging with the younger students, but um, they're also getting all the in-school supports. And I should mention um, that we're also, we also started our transitional kindergarten program, which we're super excited about because uh, we were planning to do that two years ago. It's kind of a jumpstart kindergarten program. So students who, uh, they're starting kindergarten really now in January and getting additional uh, months of kindergarten before they would actually 
really start kindergarten in the fall. Um, and that's uh, been started at uh, Washington and Amistad. And um, there's a, a process for identifying which students through um, our partnerships with ECAP and Head Start and so forth, how to, how to identify students who are going to benefit from that kind of program most. But um, anyway, I'll wrap it up here and just want to make sure that our families know we'll continue to get the word out through email and other channels. The families can access up to 10 hours for each student of the high dosage tutoring um, through our partnership with Varsity Tutors. And we're using, again, ESSER dollars, that one-time COVID relief money um, to help with social, emotional, and academic supports for our students. So I just wanted to give that little update and then we'll get back to all of the mask updates and so forth um, during the other part of the presentation tonight. Thank you. Zach? Yeah. I, I know you have stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Always. <clears throat> yes. So I um, was pretty honored to be a part of three different meetings uh, with WASDA. They put on a student, so our student rep network, which uh, I think I've talked about quite a bit, so I won't go over the details there. But uh, we met with the Lieutenant Governor Jay Inslee and Chris Reichdale for various lengths of time. Um, it was pretty interesting. Uh, we got about half the time was used for them to explain their positions. Now the other half the time was used for Q&A um, where different students got to ask questions and whatnot. So it was pretty constructive uh, environment. Um, I didn't agree with everything, but uh, it was it was good to hear um, their passion for education. I think I left each meeting uh, really with them having a, a focus on education. Um, and that was cool to, to walk away with. I especially uh, appreciate Mr. Reipdell because he's going to start having quarterly meetings with this group. Um, so that was that was good to see. Um, and he kind of highlighted some of our kind of gave a, a, us a little early heads up that some of the stuff we we're going to be talking about later. So that was kind of nice to hear from. Um, I wanted to give a huge uh, kind of like thank you for a lot of the programs that the district's been able to support. We heard about it a little bit from some student comment, but Shakespeare in the Snow um, and programs like that where with the current amount of, of regulations and whatnot, it takes a, a great deal of effort and time to put on. And so uh, seeing the commitment of the staff to help us make that happen has been unparalleled, impressive, inspiring, all the all the all the vocabulary words that um, you know, we held a leadership conference at Kennewick High uh, for you know ASBs across the tri season and just things like that that uh, staff has really committed to supporting us with this year. Um, Student net rep network, I like to keep you guys informed because that's kind of the, the big connection I have with WASDA and, and just uh, students from across the state that have that are in my position. Uh, we're really starting to fine tune that recommendation and guidance documents. There'll be two different documents. One is um, more geared towards giving it to student reps at the start of their term to understand like so they can really hit the ground running. And we'll have parts of that that the district will then customize so that students have um, just, you know, you one size fits all is not an approach that works for uh, school boards across the state. And then uh, recommendations just on different ways that uh, school boards can implement this position. Um, and I'm excited to say that a lot of what we do is showing up in this document. And there'll be some you know differences and whatnot, but um, a lot of it is being modeled off of four or five uh, school districts across the state. And I would say we're probably one of them, uh, or we are. I'll say confidently one of them that is kind of the model that we're really looking towards. Um, I did not go to the superintendent student advisory uh, com uh, committee meeting because I was at Shakespeare in the Snow, but I was able to hear from uh, students from one of our non comprehensive high schools and all three of our comprehensive high schools kind of what their takeaways were. It was a really, really um, productive meeting with these meetings. I think I've said it before, but I want to reiterate that students, we kind of pick the agenda. Occasionally staff has an agenda topic that they want to get student impact, student voice on, but uh, it, it's really student driven and the discussion the whole time is very student driven. Um, the students selected COVID policies, which as I'm sure you can imagine, uh, was comprehensive in the time we needed. So uh, because we missed an earlier meeting and, and it worked out well to add some time with it. And I know students really liked having that extra time to dig in on such a complex um, outcome. I did. I write this completely separate from what she says um, and ours are independent, but I happen to have in here talking about um, the commitment of the staff of the district towards mental health. And that's something that, you know, I know all of our ASBs are focused on working with 
our, our uh, counselors and our mental health therapists to help normalize that, provide resources, but really hearing the commitment in everything I do during schools, whether it be at the teacher level, the administrative level, ASB, all of those levels, and here tonight, we're hearing the commitment of this district for mental health supports, and I'm, I'm really excited to hear that we're expanding that program, um, and I've had a, a few meetings with uh, to kind of discuss how uh, as ASB we can help support the mental health therapists and whatnot, but also in this position, I'm like, well, is it being well supported and whatnot? And I'm getting a resounding yes. And so that's really, really good to hear. Um, yeah, that is everything I have. Thank you. Thanks, Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you, Zach. Yep. Any questions? Very good. Ron, do you have anything this evening? I do not. Wonderful. Diane? I do. Sorry. Um, so I um, attended uh, via Zoom the, now it's every month, uh, WASDA networking webinar, which was on Tuesday. Um, Dr. Pierce and I were at the WASDA, WASDA, which is the superintendents, WASDA and school board officers, or excuse me, Vic, your group. WASBO, thank you. Um, <laughs> Too many was is there. A legislative party conference, which was um, a week ago Sunday, four hours of lots and lots of information about priorities, how, how to do things, how we're doing things, um, things that are important to all three of those groups for student improvement and other areas. Uh, we had a day on the Hill with, uh, which was virtual with uh, Representative Clippert, and that was, um, Richland and Kybe, and then we had a day on the hill with Representative Banky. That was just Richland and us, and then the eighth LD virtual town hall, which was the community one, um, to listen to their ideas about what was what are priorities. I was at the Legacy, um, that's the third annual Legacy Annual Family Fest, which I love to go to every year, and there were over 200 people. I'm not sure the breakdown exactly, but. Lots and lots of families, and we had dinner, and we had a little entertainment, and lots of food, uh, home things to give away, toys, books. It was a wonderful time. Uh, Ledge Rep Learns was yesterday, and more on bills that are germane to our schools. And then uh, the press conference today from the governor's office, beginning to talk about, um, well, mask mandates in general and mask mandates in school, beginning the conversation on that. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Micah? Yeah, I just have a, a couple, three little th quick things. First, I had a I had an opportunity to meet with uh, Dr. Tracy Pierce, Bronson Brown, Matt Scott, Vic Roberts this week. Um, I guess it was last week. It was, it was great. Uh, really informative. I learned a lot about the levies and the bonds, the schools, expansion plans, the curriculum, the budgets, how committees are formed and how that process goes. So it was a good learning experience for me and uh, they're great people and they really know their stuff. So I really appreciated them taking that time with me. Secondly, I wanna thank everybody for all the emails that they send. Um, it's really helpful. Uh, some emails um, come with opinions like follow the science um, and others have data and studies and charts and medical journals and articles and reports, et cetera. And I just wanna uh, tell everybody that I really appreciate help appreciate for my own education when people attach um, actual science and data points with their emails. Um, the third thing is, quickly, um, I am very sad the levy failed. Um, it is important to remember that God gave the, um, the kids to the parents and not the state, and it's important to remember who we represent, the kids and by, ex by extension their families. Part of our job is to represent the community. Part of our job is to make kids great while working with parents and not against them. I would love to get the next levy passed. We are in the, we are the only state in the lower 48 without an end to mask mandates. This is radicalism and it is not and it does not represent our community. It's time for us as a board to listen to the community. I guess well unfortunately when you go last most everything's already been discussed so um, I will say I met with two, I think it was two weeks ago, I met with Dr. Pierce and the administration staff um, and similar to Micah, learned a ton um, about the district's operations and 
um, all of that. And so thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to sit down with me and go through kind of an orientation with that regard. And similar to Diane, I attended the Legacy February Festival. It was amazing um, to see the staff at Legacy and the students there and what they put on and how much that meant to the community. Um, talking to a few people, they just were thrilled by it. And so I just wanted to highlight that. And um, I know Mr. Osborne's here, so please give kudos to your staff and students for such an amazing event. I look forward to attending it next year as well. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'll start with you next time. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> Back to more. Wonderful. How about you, Mike? Perfect. I've got, I've got nothing. Anyway, thank you. Okay, uh, next on the agenda is unfinished business. Uh, First topic is the Endeavor mascot naming. Paul Osborne and Dr. Pierce will be sharing this information. All right, good evening. First off, I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Galbraith, Ms. Sundvik for attending last Thursday. That was a wonderful event. It's our second in-person event for Legacy uh, since we've been able to go back to school and it's just nice to have the students, the families, everybody come in and it was a pleasant surprise to see you guys there as well too. So thank you. Uh, two months ago, I was here for Legacy to bring in a new mascot. I'm now here for our new online school uh, endeavor, which has been functioning since uh, the beginning of this school year. So uh, kind of a different environment. It's remote, it's, it's online. Uh, it uses a software program called Apex. Uh, to get our kids uh, their high school credits. Um, we've gone through this time frame without a mascot and to build some communi community and whatnot, we would like to, to go through that. So, uh, policy 9250, I believe I've read through this slide before, two months ago, but we're gonna do it again. Uh, mascots for new, new district buildings shall reflect a positive school image and expression of school unity and pride. Although the board will carefully consider community recommendations for school facility and mascot names, the final responsibility for officially naming a school building, uh, a facility with, within a school building, and school mascots rests with you, the school board. Uh, the procedure goes on to say mascots shall reflect a positive school image with an emphasis on expression of school unity and pride. If the school board decides to rename a mascot, or if it changes, which we're not doing, so we'll just skip on. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Pierce, I appreciate that. <laughs> Uh, so, same process as before, we uh, gathered uh, suggestions from the community, from the staff, from the students, compiled a list, I want to say, of about 130 uh, nominations. Um, it's becoming really apparent that a lot of good mascots have been taken. Uh, <laughs> uh, we, uh, I'll, I'll share a little story here. We kind of had this idea we would be the Endeavor Eagle, it had a great sound to it and Edison really does think that's a great sounding name. And then uh, that went through a couple times. So we have some really good mascots in this district and it took us a little bit of narrowing down and whatnot to get one that was unique, unique to our program and unique to uh, the district. So uh, the committee is up here. As you see, we have myself and our assistant principal, some counselors, a few teachers, uh, our special ed uh, case manager and two students. And all of us met uh, being an online program, we met over Zoom. Uh, like I said, did ours in person af afterwards, but we found a way to do this over Zoom so that everybody uh, could attend all the meetings. So like I said, we sent out a community input survey. Uh, that survey, uh, a portion of it said that the school district was seeking suggestions for a mascot for Endeavor High School. Uh, the deadline for that survey was December 1st to ask two questions. My new mascot idea for Endeavor is and this name should be considered by the mascot rec recommendation committee because. After compiling all of those 130 names, getting it down, weeding out the ones that we were duplicates and whatnot, we got it down to three choices. I'd like to point out that the third one is a duplicate. <laughs> uh, I believe uh, Eastgate. Uh, was brought to our attention after we had narrowed it down to, to three names. We left it on there because I would like to show you that we had three names at that time. I would highly advise that we don't you know, duplicate that choice. Our top two choices were Bobcats and Raptors. I'd like to talk about those for just a second. We had actually ended up with Raptors for a long time, but we found there was a lot of confusion along the word Raptors. 
Some of you might be thinking about birds right now. Oh. Some of you might be thinking about dinosaurs right now. Okay. So we found that that might be a confusing name. It had a, we had some good logo ideas in our heads. We were actually thinking the bird, but we found that there was a lot of confusion there. So thus we ended up with our top choice, bobcats. <coughs> the committee has a couple things to say about bobcats. The bobcat is a small but fierce animal native to the area. They are resourceful and resilient and easily, and easily adapt to their changing environments. Uh, one staff member, and this kind of stuck with me a little bit, said bobcats are solitary animals and mainly nocturnal. <laughs> now, Endeavor High School is a unique environment that allows our students to work at home and at a pace that reflects their individual learning. Not all our students are nocturnal, not all our students are solitary. Some are, but it provides that opportunity for a unique environment where kids can work at night or kids can work on their own if, if that's what best suits their, suits their needs. Some of the student feedback when we sent out a student survey says, I like the Bobcat as Endeavor High School's mascot because it is unique and they're native to the area. This is my favorite because Bobcats are agile and fast. Sure, they're a little small, but they pack a punch. <laughs> and bobcats because they're small, excuse me, strong, small, and fast animals. So keeping my words a little short tonight, I'd like you to consider uh, bobcat as the new mascot for Endeavor High School. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions? Thoughts, comments? I like the nocturnal comment, that's great. Would you like motion? There you go. I would entertain a motion. I'd like to make a motion that we accept the name of Bobcats as the mascot for Endeavor High School. I'll second it. Right, first and second. How do you call for the roll call vote, please? Mr. Galbraith? Yes. Mr. Valentine? Yes. Ms. Sunbeck? Yes. Mr. Mabry? Yes. Mr. Connors? Yes. Wonderful. Congratulations. All right. Thank you, everybody. Okay, second on our unfinished business is COVID-19 related items and board advocacy. Dr. Tracy Pierce will start us off. Okay, and Bronson Brown uh, is also here tonight. He'll, he'll be helping out along the way. Uh, so this is a continuation of a presentation from last time with some updates and so forth. So I'm just going to touch on again the board shared priorities that you all identified at the retreat a couple eight weeks ago, maybe now. Um, I'm going to provide an up-to-date uh, update on the mask mandates, breaking news kind of today. We'll touch on again just local board authority and advocacy. Uh, the current board legislative priorities, and then we've got information to bring back that the board requested on Senate Bill 5909, House Bill 1772, and Senate Bill 5039, along with a draft resolution for the board to uh, discuss and consider. Uh, I'm going to provide an update on the State Board of Health's vaccine consideration and that whole process and then there'll be lots of time for board discussion and uh, we can you all have a copy of the board discussion protocol that can help structure that discussion piece when we get to that so just to remind uh, the board and everyone here the board went through a process in january to identify what are the current uh, priorities of the board and there are many shared priorities that were identified really falling into these different areas of student safety understanding navigating COVID, funding, student learning and performance. And of course, you know, we provided some updates that uh, touched on all of these areas or many of these areas last time around. You just heard our um, levy update. Uh, most of what we're gonna be uh, focusing on tonight is the whole understanding navigating COVID and the board's advocacy role and those kinds of things. So I want to start with, because I know this is um, going to be of interest, obviously, to everybody. It's um, the update on where we are with the state mask mandate. So some things happened this week. Um, first of all, on Monday, if, if you're following the news, uh, you'll see that state health officials in Oregon announced a schedule to lift the mask mandate in Oregon. I just want to be clear, we're talking about Oregon right now. In the coming weeks, um, based on they're looking at their current hospitalization trends. That's what I have read. Um, so in Oregon, they're talking about the mandate being lifted for indoor public spaces in K-12 schools on March 31st. I've got an article uh, posted here. I'm sure there's other articles and other information, but this is the information that I 
um, have seen uh, and read and what uh, what we all I think probably know is that Oregon, California and Washington have been pretty close with a lot of decision making and timelines throughout the whole COVID situation. So then um, another thing happened this week on Tuesday. So uh, King 5 News, which is out, uh, it's, it's NBC News in Seattle. Um, they interviewed State Superintendent Chris Reichdahl. And um, the, the link to the full interview is here at the bottom. You can see, but I just took a quote out uh, where Superintendent Reichdahl says, it's time to make the evolution. It's time to make the change. So we, meaning OSPI, the state, they're working every day with DOH, the State Department of Health and the governor's office. And OSPI has encouraged them to think intensely about this. Superintendent Reichdahl said it is time to make the next transition in this pandemic and that is likely a mask optional. Our schools are ready to make this transition. So I, I know this because I was on a monthly webinar that Superintendent Reichdahl holds with superintendents from all across the state. And uh, it happened to be Tuesday afternoon where um, he shared that he had uh, just done this interview with, with King 5 News. And I've shared this with individual um, parents who have contacted me throughout this whole situation. I've shared it with board members. Um, at these meetings, my superintendent colleagues and I continue to share what we hear from our communities on all of these issues. We, we share everything that we are hearing from the community. And uh, in fact, I, I asked Superintendent Reichdahl during that meeting if we could have some sort of letter or something, um, if he was talking to the media on the west side, some sort of letter or something that he could provide to, to superintendents across the state um, that we could share with our communities. Um, at, during the meeting, um, he said no but I'll give you an update here. Um, and OSPI continued to stress that the decision is up to DOH and the governor's office. And um, we did ask during the meeting, we, my superintendent colleagues and I, but we were not provided with a specific timeline. So that was yesterday. Then today at 2 p.m., uh, Superintendent Reichdahl issued a press release and, and sent it out to everybody in the state. And I've just got a snippet of it here from an email. Uh, and But you can see the headline. It says, from pandemic to endemic, it's time to remove the state mask mandate for students. And Superintendent Reichdahl uh, issued a statement on his recommendation to the P Department of Health and to the governor um, to make masks a local health department decision for students in K-12. So I have that and I can I can send you the full you know press release. It's obviously available all to the public. Um, but I you know uh, I, I don't want to read the whole thing. He talks a lot about cases and hospitalization rates and um, but he says as part of my recommend. Well, yeah, he I'm trying to find the part I wanted to highlight. It's basically there. Um, he, you know, he talks a lot about safety and all of these things. Um, he says my recommendation today reflects my belief again I'm quoting Superintendent Reichdahl that the benefits of making this change outweigh the ongoing impacts of the learning environment as well as the challenges of maintaining a fixed statewide policy. Then he ends with as a reminder masks are still required in the school environment at this time per Department of Health requirements and he states this is ultimately a decision of the governor with professional guidance from officials at the Department of Health and he he says I it's Superintendent Reichdahl will uphold and respect their ultimate decision and guidance for our students and school personnel. Then you probably know this afternoon, right about that same time that this um, statement was issued from Superintendent Reichdahl's office, the governor held a press conference and he stated uh, that now is not the time for lifting mask mandates, but the mandates will be lifted in the upcoming weeks. That's what this, the governor said today. He stated that they, the state, are looking at the data and they'll likely have a specific date next week. State Superintendent Reichdahl stated that masks are still required per governor, et cetera. Um, this is my talking point at the end here. I believe, I believe based on what we've heard this week that all signs are pointing to the state mask mandate being lifted soon. I do not have a specific timeline. I only have the information that I was shared. I've asked for a specific timeline. I've asked for more. We 
just I don't know, but that is what I do know and where we are. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Do you want to have any questions? Okay. I will keep you updated to the minute um, as you know, if, there, if there's anything more. This all kind of happened in the last couple of days and then this afternoon. So we're going to move into. Sorry, real oh, quick. oh, I'm sorry. No, no, you're, it's okay. Kind of late question. So if and, and this is I'm asking because I don't know if and when the mandate is lifted and the governor says they're good to come off. How how do we react to that? How quickly as a board or a district can we react to that to ensure? Like, do we have to have a special meeting to do something, or does that mean it's gone once he says it's gone? And so I'll I'll um, clarify, and then obviously other board members who've been here. The board has never taken any formal action to okay. require masks in schools because they don't have the authority <laughs> okay. to do it or not do it. So it's always been following the requirements of the state. Gotcha. Um, early on, and I touched on this just last time, but just early on, um, when so the governor closed schools and then the state said, OK, local districts, you figure out when to reopen based on all these guidelines, right? And so that's when our local board was making decisions about our, with consultation from Benton Franklin Health District for when we could open and when we were ready with all the requirements and so forth. So there was voting happening at the board during that time. Then the state came in and changed and said, <laughs> everybody statewide open, because some school districts weren't opening. And then they said, no more is this a local decision. These decisions are no longer local board decisions state we're making the decisions so i just want to clarify that so i agree with what i think the um the the three board members who were here during that time can attest to the fact that there was never any decision made at our local board about masks okay yes Micah. and this is for staff and students correct you know that's a very good um that's a that's a very good question um I'm the headline. Let me see if I can read this a little more carefully. Like I said, I just came across my desk at two. And as you're looking at looking mm -hmm. that up, um, just point of clarification. This is not saying no masks. This is just. I mean, this is this is choice. This is mask choice, right? Not no mask. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. My interpretation of this I agree. It's talking about removing the mask mandate. The headline does say for students, but I would need to read it a little carefully. And then it just goes on to talk about schools and school employees. So I don't believe there was any distinction, but I honestly would need to go back and figure, find out that for sure. Zach, you have a question? Yeah, so I know you just got this stuff. So if you don't have any answers, I completely understand that. But um, in a few parts, it's mentioned the Department of Health then making the decision. Is that the case? Or is it they're going to remove the mask mandate and then this and then it's done? Or is it getting kicked down to the local health departments? That's yeah, yeah, the way we yeah, the way I read it is that it would go back to the local health department. And I'd say uh, just from my perspective, I think that's a very good question. The the information from OSPI talks about it the recommendation of the state superintendent making it. He's recommending to the State Department of Health and the governor that it becomes a local decision. But I I don't know. I was not actually able to watch the governor's press conference today. So I don't know if he made. I don't know. So other board, I mean, board members may Mike, know. Can I speak to that? Yes. So um, there was a question from um, Austin at NPR, and, and there are three levels. There's a county level, there's um, a workplace level, which is L&I, and then there are federal uh, mandates for public transit. And so the question was, you know, what, what part does the governor's lifting of this mandate um, connect with? And the governor's answer was that he would remove the state mandate other systems have requirements. Local health districts have authority. Federal public transit have the freedom to make decisions for public transit. And there is an issue, he said, with multiple jurisdictions. So he reiterated that would be state 
employees state things, but not connected to federal. And Ellen and I might have some different things to say, I guess, about their workers, depending on where they work. Thank you. Any more questions? Okay, so we'll we'll keep going then and just uh, touch on again. We we just touched briefly on the board does have an advocacy role and there's, um, you know, a, a, as you board members know in your work with WASDA, there's advocacy talked about in every year, um, kind of how, how you can advocate as a school board member at the local, state and federal level. And then every year the board uh, goes through a process of discussing and updating legislative priorities prior to session. This particular document was done uh, prior to the new board members being elected, but we did update it with your names because it reflects the, the board's priorities as a whole. So I do have copies of this if you want to reference it at any time during the, the board discussion. I'll, I'll hand you the hard copy just so you can remember. But really the focus of the priorities are much the same as what you identified in January during the board retreat. Adequate and equitable K-12 funding, access and opportunity for students and educators and safe and sufficient school facilities. And then obviously you've mentioned some other things too that we're talking about tonight. So that brings us to looping back um, with some information and a report on the three bills that you asked us to do some research on. And so uh, the, uh, the three bills are co all concerning uh, guber guber gubernatorial uh, <laughs> powers and emergency powers and those sorts of things. So I'll take us just quickly again. I you sent you some information and then I'll just take it, us quickly through some of the summaries and where people can find this information and then I'll um, ask uh, Bronson to come up and, and talk further. So this is just a snip from the ledge.wa.gov uh, site and so everybody can everybody has access to the site and you click on the tab to the right that says bills and, and then you plug in the bill number and it'll bring up where the bill, who sponsored the bill. So Senate Bill 5909 concerning legislative oversight of gubernatorial powers concerning emergency proclamations and unanticipated receipts. You can see who the sponsors were um, and where it is in the process. So this was as of Friday. I checked yesterday and it didn't have any updated status, but it's introduced um, and it's gone to committee. And then um, if you scroll down on the screen, it'll give you links to like the original bill and bill reports and so forth. So some of what I have here is just out of the bill report. So this is a summary of the bill. I won't read all of this to you, but um, it's it's uh, looking at, you know, restricting or putting some boundaries around um, emergency powers um, and so forth. And then um, here's a longer summary of the bill. So it's a little more like what if what happens once it's been more than 90 days if the governor's declared a state of emergency, it speaks to the powers of the governor. Um, and it, it, all of the bills include notes in terms of there's a fiscal uh, impact and if they've requested a fiscal note and when it would take effect and so forth. So this one you can see creates a committee commissioner task force that includes legislative members. And then um, same for this is House Bill 1772. Um, it's also been sent to committee. You can see who all the sponsors are. Uh, this limits the state of emergency to a 60 day duration unless extended by the legislature. Um, it limits some governor orders, uh, authorizes the legislature to terminate a state of emergency or reinstate a previously terminated state of emergency. So it gives some more power to the legislature, all of these do. And here's a more um, complete summary of the bill. So let you look at it for a minute. There's no appropriation. There's not a fiscal note requested and that this bill in includes uh, an emergency clause that would make it take effect immediately. And there's some penalties and things, so forth in here. Okay. And then the final one, and, and Bronson will elaborate here, but in here, Senate Bill um, 5039, also in committee, you can see who all the sponsors are. 
Um, and this one, they didn't have the same kind of bill summary. Uh, it was just an update, like the strike through, you can see an underline of text amending RCW 4306-220. So you just have to sort of follow where the strike throughs are and where the underlines are. So they're striking through, getting proposing getting rid of some language, adding other language, and then toward the bottom, there's a new section, section two. And so this, this is a kind of a high level overview of these three bills. And then I'm gonna invite Bronson to come up and, and talk a little further. And you can use this one, Bronson. So um, Tracy's handing out a, a copy of a draft. It's actually a draft proclamation Proclamation or resolution will do the same thing. So, um, I drafted this up based on your feedback from the last meeting and trying to guess what you may want in the proclamation. So, um, as you look through it, this is your proclamation. So, if there's things that you, the board, wants to change or edit, um, we can. Do, I can make those those changes and then. Um, and then you can you can vote on it if you want, or you don't have to vote on it. You can tell me to go back and, and write something else. So this proclamation, it addresses both of the Senate bills, 5909, 5309, and, and then House Bill 1772. And um, the intent, as you'll read through this, the intent of the proclamation is, is just to show support for the um, limiting the governor's emergency powers in the future. Um, and and so each one of these bills do that. I'm going to bring it up. So oh, sure. Yeah. So you can do it. Okay. okay. Bronson, can I ask a question? Could we have just a couple minutes to read this really quickly? Because I really want to listen to you, but I want to read it first. Sure. Thank I'll, you. I'll be quiet. Just, just, just let a, me know. Like, just let me know when you're ready. Like, I've Chance to go through it? Yeah. Wonderful. Bronson, if you continue, please, that would be great. Sure. So, the uh, as you can see, the intent of the proclamation is to try to capture the spirit of these three bills, not focus on one necessarily, but all, all three bills, the intent of it is to limit the uh, emergency powers of the governor and essentially give the, the power back to the legislature to, to make the laws, since uh, those are the uh, that is the legislative branch. That's what they're tasked to do. So that's what this does. And as Tracy, she, she kind of summarized the, the three bills. And as you'll notice, there's slight differences between each of them. Uh, 1772 is the only one that would actually go into effect immediately upon passage. And it, it has a 60 day provision in it. Uh, emergency would just last 60 days before the legislature has to give approval. The um, 5909 is, is 90 days or yeah, 90 days, and then it doesn't go into effect until 90 days after the legislature's out of session. 
Um, Senate Bill 5039, I think, I believe is um, the same bill that was proposed last year and it died. And so um, it was proposed again this year also. So um, if there's any changes you want or, or any any feedback you want to give me or it's it's your proclamation. Um, I guess the last the last thing I'll, I'll say is uh, this proclamation will be actually be filed here at the district. Um, if you want uh, staff to <clears throat> send it to the your local legislators so they could use it as they are in Olympia. If you want it forwarded to other folks, um, you can just let staff know and we can accompany it with a letter and forward it on to the officials or, or whoever you would like to, to see the, the proclamation. Great, thank you, Bronson. So I think it's important that we really think about why we're doing this and what the intent behind this is. And the big thing is I think it's really captured in this one, two, three, four, five, in the sixth paragraph. You know, the emergency powers of the governor related to COVID-19 has limited the ability of school boards to set certain policies regarding the regulation of safety, health, and staff and students. Yeah. And that's really what we're doing because, again, I know everyone doesn't agree with us on this, but if we want to keep these schools open and in person, we have to follow the rules, whether we like them or not. That being said, we also have the opportunity to say, hey, look, you know, <laughs> enough is enough. We have legislators that we sent to Olympia to voice and, and you know advocate for us and currently that is going in my in my personal opinion on you so do you guys have any questions I'll start with Diane so Bronson um, amendments can still be made to these correct? they can yeah they can be changed yes. all the way up until they're until the last and even later so my question is if we hard copy 1772 five and in in their places what they are now if an amendment is made we have signed on to that so not knowing until the very last day what happens with amendments what what's the yeah so you issue? could you could ask some, add some additional language there and said the proposed bills house bill these bills or similar bills that limit the emergency powers of the governor so it would cover if there's any other new bills that are proposed during legislature it would, it would capture that too. It, my, my concern is sometimes things are watered down. Mm -hmm. Sometimes things are stuck in because I want something for my particular area. And I know we've seen this before in things that we thought we were really for. And so I'm, I'm for this, but I worry about those unintended consequences that attorneys are very good about knowing. And so I, I like it, but what do we do about that? So Diane, oh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, go ahead. I, I just wonder if there's a way to say, you know, as drafted or like to put a date on it or something That's, so it's clear about which version. That was my question because I said date specific. Can you make a date specific? Or how about if I may jump in here saying uh, the proposed bills, blah, 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 you know, whose spirit and intent is to limit the emergency powers of the governor. Because that's that's ultimately what we're we're asking, I believe. Yeah, we are, but uh, that spirit can change. That's my concern. <laughs> right, but we're, we're signing on. We're signing on and dating this, right? So, I mean, if I guess if things were to change, is that something we could we would revisit, or it's we could, but um, I mean, want to sign. I'm sorry, to I didn't interrupt, but we we can certainly revisit whenever we want. But the bigger question is, you know, again, we're going to sign up, we're going to stamp it, say yes, we're. Yeah, yeah. We're for this right now, but to Diane's point, they can come in and they say, oh, by the way, we want to build a bridge in Marysville, you know, but you just never know. So right. I mean, that's, that's the part that could come down. And then at that time we could revisit it, but as it stands right now and with this at this date, at this time, what we're asking for is basically a local control, right? That's what we're asking for. I mean, Washington state constitution uses the word uh, paramount priority. It's the only time it uses the paramount and then it was defined by the utmost, the most important thing. So the Washington state constitution has a law, the governor has a proclamation. So sort of these two things are at odds, right? So we're trying to say like, hey, we want to have local control. So the way that it's, the way that at this point in time right now, we're saying we support these bills and if they do change, if they do add a, if they do like add a, 
a, a bridge in Marysville to this bridge, then to this build, and then we should definitely revisit them. But that by the time we signed it, that Marysville bridge was not included in it. So at the time we signed it, we agree with them. So I would like to 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 move forward and sign this. Okay, Ron, do you have any? I do. Please. I, I have the other side, the flip side. First thing I want to uh, admit that it's different than what I thought. I thought we were showing uh, uh, educating people, saying, "Hey, be aware, this bill, these three bills are out there. They could affect Kennewick School District." I thought that was the effort. Uh, I felt a little um, hesitant to say that we we sway one way or the other because we are the school board. We're not. We, yeah, we, we try to be apolitical. And so when you start, there are some citizens that may feel like that we are trying to sway the citizens to believe one way or the other. And if you do that, you're gonna leave some citizens out. So just don't, don't, don't hate me too much, but all I'm saying is that uh, I think we would do a great service if we said, hey, citizens, here are three bills that you should keep your eye on. And here's how they could affect Kennewick School District. At that point, it's up to the citizens to go and say, oh boy, you're right, or you're wrong, or whatever. But that that leaves us, again, providing information to the, to the citizens, but at the same time, not trying to guide it one way or the other. Yes, Mike. So I would just respectfully uh, kind of counter that. I think that what this is doing is it is it is listening to the citizens. When you have a mandate in place, what you're saying is we are not listening to the citizens because there is one person mandating what we do. All we're saying is that we as citizens, as local citizens, would like the decision, that decision. So now we can listen to our community to give strength to your argument. Your argument actually argues for this bill for this this uh, discussion because now all of a sudden we're saying hey citizens now we can now we actually can listen to you and we can do something about it but without this what we're saying is we can't do anything sorry sorry I, thanks for talking but we can't do anything right so now we are giving actually giving power to the people which is which is how our republic works i i read this as saying we would just like local control back. And this is a way for us to share our thoughts and let people know that we'll, the, the emergency powers that it be are, it's, it's been too long. And this is us, I feel, standing up and saying, we, we would like local control to make those decisions. What those decisions are, that's for another discussion. But this to me is just saying, hey, we, we're looking for that local control back, and that's that's where I see it as. Tracy, can you scroll just a little bit so you see the bottom? Yeah. So, okay, do you have something okay. else, Diane? I want to ask Gabe. So, Gabe, when you're talking about local control, so when you read uh, one, two, three, fourth, whereas, whereas the legislature is the appropriate branch of the government to issue laws affecting the operation of schools okay, and then it goes on power to enact etc that doesn't talk about local control so it, I, I think there's two several things there we're talking about the legislature as a representative of people of our our representatives are the ones to make that decision that those decisions would remain votable by our legislator who are ostensibly you know outreach of us but it doesn't talk about local control in, in that area. So I just don't want you to feel like it says local control. And I'm, I'm not sure that's what I read on that. The next paragraph does say lo local control. I think I think the reason why, Bronson, correct me if I'm wrong, the reason why we say legislator there is because we say in order to make an actual law, it needs to be legislated. It can't be mandated by one person. So now we're saying that you, we can't, that is covering both bases. It says, it says, 
you, this law, you can't mandate a law. It has to be actually go through Congress. That's that's the actual process. And number two, the next one, it does what, what, what Mike read. It does talk about local control. So I feel like it does cover both of those things. They, they can give power to the schools. That's the thing. That's yeah, who the, the legislature, the not not has, not the has given power. Right. So that's okay. that's actually how the process works, right? The legislator gives the power, not the not the governor doesn't mandate and just dictate what everybody does, right? Okay. Let's, let's make sure we're all just one person talking at one time, please. Um, I think and I'm going to jump in here. I think Ron's concern is really that he does not want to politicize this body, and I think that's important to remember that you know our job here is to re represent all all the staff all the citizens all the students 100 percent and you know i want to make sure that we are again listening to the people making sure we're doing what is right for the district and uh that's that's important to do again i'm in support of this but i also think that we also need to be very careful about the way we're going forward here that we are not a political body we are apolitical we are here to oversee the operation the successful operation of the education of these children. That is our overriding principle. Yep. And this allows us to do that. I, I'm I, with you. Ron, can I ask you a question? Sure. Is there anything in this that you feel is, is apolitical enough? That's not really the word I'm looking for. But that you feel would be apolitical to put out a statement? I, I, I would answer that with the question. I know that's not no, that's proper, fine. but you as a citizen, Let's say citizen A and citizen B. Is there a chance that citizen A may agree with this and citizen B yep. not? So, and, and would that be based on a political stance? Then, then we need to. I, I'm not shooting it down, guys. No, I understand. I, I'm just saying, be careful. Our community, we all know, even with these votes that's going around and the levy that got shut down, it was almost 50%. And so you still got 50%. I'm sorry. Well, no, you can't talk to you. I'm sorry. You still have 50%. Even the levies, you have one pass, one didn't. Sure. So it's all going right down the middle. So you're going to leave out a certain part of the community, possibly, if we make a proclamation. I'm saying we say something. But I'm saying we say, community, this is how it could affect your schools. This is how it could affect your students. You educate, and then you leave it up to the community to go to their legislators and say, hey, we heard at the school board that this could happen. Or, hey, legislator, what is it going on about uh, the, the governor having more power or less power, whatever which way you stand on it? We give them the catalyst to make that choice, to make that next move. Mike, hold on, hold on. Okay, Ron. Okay. Yes, Michael. So you're 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 quite literally agreeing because what you're saying is that you want to make make a non-political statement and you want to give people that choice and that's what this does without so it, it it's it's really an issue of choice versus no choice, right? So what we're saying is although that 50-50 vote you're talking about now that 50-50 vote, we can we can actually listen and do something about it, right? We're at right now we can't. So what we're saying is we want to listen to both of those sides, and so we want the ability to listen to both of those sides and act on behalf of them. It's, that's what we're saying. So so when you say that that this doesn't do that, it's the opposite, right? Because now we are listening. Now we have the ability to listen and to act on behalf of the of the body rather than just accept a mandate. Please. And I apologize for being not so clear, but look at section one, it, where it says the Kennewick School Board supports. So, so when you say Kennewick School Board supports, you're not getting 50-50 there. You made a decision. We made a decision right here. And we're saying we support uh, not giving the governor powers. And maybe we do, but there may be some folks out there, 50-50, that wants the governor to be decisive. Maybe he wants to be a strong leader. Maybe, and I'm, I'm just saying, I'm not saying that is me. I'm not saying that's me. I'm just saying that there's that opinion out there. We want decision makers. That's why we elect our officials. That's why we are elected. They want somebody to make a decision. So if we sit here and say we support the passage of House Bill 
1772, we are saying we support limiting the power of the governor. Fine thing to say. And giving power locally. Oh my God. Fine thing to no, no, please. Fine thing to say, but as a board, do we want to say, hey, we educate you. This is what those books are about. Get to the people in Olympia and make your voices heard. So, Ron, I'm going to jump in here. So, okay. and to, 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 the, to your point, right. you know, because I was, I've been following these along, sure. looking at the people who've been making, making, who, who we have educated to participate. Again, I've seen people in the room who spoke, sure. looked at the, you know, were, were part of these listening sessions. So, to your point, we have moved it forward because we have people who came to the board advocating for the kids, were part of those listening process, listening sessions, and advocated. So, to your point, that's exactly that's exactly what we did. And again, that is, again, I have some of the same concern. Again, is that, again, I support this. I believe this this is, is a good direction to go. However. My overriding concern is the, is the politi politicalization of this board, because again, Ron is correct. We're saying that the board supports this. So now we're now taking a political position for an apolitical board. So that's that is the, that is the concern. Can I make a motion? You may make a motion. I move that we I move that we accept this this proclamation. Okay. I second. First and the second, do we have any discussion? Yes, Diane. Is there a way in in the wording to to take to take Ron's suggestions, which I also have concerns about the politicization of it? Is there a way to say support the? I'm just bringing this up out of here. Support the education of our support the, you know, something of our community to look at these, because what is in the body is good information. Is there a way so that the board is not actually supporting, but the board is educating or sharing this or anywhere that may fit in that? that is that something wrong that you feel comfortable with or would you just prefer not? No, I feel good. I even have a suggestion, uh, in which it would be amendment to the motion, but it would be a suggestion. And we say in section one that the Kennewood School Board informs the public how the passage of House Bill 1772-5909 and Senate Bill 5992 would give the power to let you leave and, and just state what it would do informs the public on how or what it would do. Okay, I have an amended motion. So we need to vote on the amended motion first. You need a second. I need a second. I will second the amendment. Okay. So we had an amended motion and a second. And so how do, would you guys like to read that back? How you'd like that to read? You need to. The vote on the first one. Oh, the vote on the first. Okay, I'm sorry. I do need to hear exactly what we're voting on. Thank you. How that's, we yeah, I need to. Yeah, I need to need the words properly. How we're going to vote on the amendment. That would be what you wrote. Will... An amendment would read: The Kennewood School Board informs the public on how the passage of House Bill 1772, Senate Bill 5909, and our Senate Bill 5939 would give the Washington State Legislature authority to end and or approve a state of emergency in gubernatorial orders prohibiting certain activities during an emergency. Okay. okay, Patty, do you have that? Yes, I think I do. Wonderful. Okay, Patty, can I call the, for the roll call vote on the amendment? Okay, Mr. Galbraith. Right. We're, we're voting on the amendment, not the we're original the motion. So are we going to vote on the original motion next? To, to. Just, if this gets out. shot down, then you go back to the original motion. Okay. okay. So, Mr. Galbraith? No. Mr. Valentine? No. Ms. Sunvik? Yes. Mr. Um, Mabry? Yes. And Mr. Connors? Yes. So now I'll go back to the original motion yes. as amended. The, as amended, so that's. Call 
for the roll call vote, please. Original motion as what? Amended. As amended. I think so it would just be the original motion because you motion. vote. Yeah, you yeah, already voted on the, the amended Thank one. You. Okay. I'm still learning. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, so, I just want to make sure. I, I want but, to. But if you, you, kind of de facto, voted no on the first one because you right. voted on the, you made an amendment and voted on it, approved it. But so, so you can go ahead and vote on the first one. We're just. But, but, you, know, it, but you, need you, you need to make a new motion. The first one is gone you because you because if you because if you vote on the first one and approve the first one, then you just undid the motion you just right. passed. Okay, gotcha. Okay. So okay, so we all right. So it's passed as amended. Okay. It's as amended. Yeah, right. Right. Oh, yeah. You want me to do? Oh, okay. Mike, well, yes, sir. while uh, Tracy does that, can we take a quick five minute break? Uh, yeah, we can take a five minute recess. Okay. Okay, perfect. We'll, we'll come back at uh, 740.
Okay, uh, so we are now on uh, State Board of Health COVID vaccine consideration. Hey, just one thing. Yes, sir, Mike. Uh, so we uh, tried to capture what the amendment was. It's in red. So if the board just wants to look on the screen just to confirm that's what it was. We just we just added in section one in, instead of supports. We took that out and put informs the public on how and then kept all the rest of the language in. That is how I understand it. Yes. Informs yes. the public on how the yep. Oh yes. <laughs> it doesn't make sense. But it, that doesn't really make sense. The town is supposed to enforce the public on how to support. To support. On how, how to, yeah, that's not what that support is 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 struck yeah. out. On uh, how the it should be on how the passage of the support is struck out. And how the passage of uh, the passage of yeah. oh, HB etc. Supports is out. I see. Yeah. Support is this correct. Yeah. Support should be struck. It is struck out. We just can't see it. Yeah. I need something. Yep. Oh, it, yeah, it is. There we go. <laughs> I did. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you, Bronson. Okay, so I'll think we might don't go too far. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so next on the agenda is State Board of Health's COVID-19 vaccine consideration. Okay, so this um, continuing with the update. <clears throat> so I thought it would be helpful just to start with um, how how vaccine requirements for schools are determined and who determines those. So that is a, a job that the Washington State Department of Health does. So um, there's current vaccine requirements, students entering school, preschool through grade 12. This is all information from uh, DOH and we also have it on our website for families every year. It shows the charts, um, what the required doses are in terms of immunization requirements and um, how the requirements follow the National Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices immunization schedule with requirements specified by grade level. So um, if you click on the PDF, um, I just chose the one in English. This is the chart from DOH that has the required immunizations for school year 21-22 um, for K-6. Everyone, please. We have everyone's attention. We're trying to get through our meeting. For K-6 and also through 712. And so you can see the doses um, required for what's currently in place, hepatitis B, DTAP, Tdap, polio, um, MMR, measles, mumps, rubella, and chicken pox. And uh, there are immunization, there are exemptions um, for some of the current immunization requirements. Um, Washington state law allows parents or guardians to exempt their child from the school or, or child care immunization requirements. Um, exemptions may be claimed for personal. Mr. Anderson, Ms. Bird, Mr. Anderson, Ms. Bird, if you guys could go out to the hallway to, for your conversation, please, we would appreciate it greatly. Thank you. Exemptions can be claimed for personal, philosophical, religious, or medical reasons. Um, however, MMR, measles, mumps, rubella, cannot be exempted for personal, philosophical reasons. And then there's a process to request an exemption and complete a, a certificate of exemption to the school or child care center, et cetera. So this is all just information of what is uh, when it comes to immunization requirements for schools and what the what the exemption uh, process is and the fact that Washington State Department of Health determines this stuff. So currently, and we sent out a survey uh, a couple of weeks ago to our families in our school district so they could provide their input directly to the state board. So the State Board of Health right now and the Department of Health have convened a technical advisory group to consider a COVID-19 vaccine against the State Board of Health's criteria. So they have some criteria that they take things through um, and then they make a, this 
TAG would make a recommendation to the State Board of Health of whether or not to add it to the required list that I just showed you um, for school entry. They did, I just want to reiterate, conduct an input survey. It was, I believe, two Fridays ago. We, when we got that information, we sent it out to families in our district to make them aware that this input survey was being conducted. And so uh, people hopefully had the opportunity to take that survey and have their um, voice um, heard. So there is a meeting coming up. I just tried to get some updated information to find out where this was in process. There's a meeting coming up uh, tomorrow. And I took, a, I took a clip from their website and there's a link here for how, um, how you can get to the website. So the links on the bottom, it shows like their meeting agenda and so forth. Um, when I clicked on the agenda, the tag meeting agenda, this is what came up. What you see on the screen, so they're, re they're still in the process of reviewing some of these uh, criteria. There's a, a link here that um, gives you uh, this meeting information. And then uh, on this next screen, you'll see there's a Zoom link so people can access the meeting. And uh, I, I, I believe, I, from what I understand, like attend it remotely to observe. I don't believe there's public comment al allowed at the meeting. I think they're taking the survey input that they received and considering that as public comment, at least at this upcoming meeting. That's my understanding. So I wanted to provide the update to the board and then um, provide the opportunity for the board to have a discussion about this and direct uh, me and staff if there's any next steps you want to pursue. Wonderful, thank you. So we don't have any questions about the state of this. It seems like at this point it's still, they're, they're looking at it, but that's kind of all they've done at this point. So at this point there is no mandate they're just studying it, correct? My yes. Okay. okay. So I guess that um, my my primary concern is sort of like dividing the community. Obviously, you know, if we listen to the community, which is I think our job. I think they're going to be very divided on this. And I think again, the 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 only solution is choice. You have to be able to give people choice. And I stand for that. And I think that that it would be it'd be wise to to make a resolution against a, a forced vaccination in our school district. Does anyone else have any comments? Gabe? Yeah, I would I would kind of second that and I think there's a lot going on obviously with the vaccine mandate a lot that um, we may not know, um, but I, I do feel very passionate that we do know that this is going to be a topic that's going to come up multiple times in the next few months as this these meetings go along. And I think we can assume um, where this is going to go. And so I think proactively we need to let people know where where we are on on uh, this vaccine mandate and whether or not we're going to impose it on our our students in the district. So I'm going to jump in here to begin. It is, it is, it is not a vaccine mandate, and we need to be careful about how we, we verbalize this because there is no mandate as of now. Right. So as we're having this conversation, we need to make sure that that is not part of our vocabulary here. Okay. It is a proposed. They're studying it. It's something that will be ongoing. You know. And again, I'm going to pair it Ron here. Our job at this point is to educate the public. Say, hey, these are coming on. Please go be part of this advocate for yourselves, contact your legislators, do everything you can to go do this. Because again, at this point, there's really, it's still in a study session. So at this point, I believe we're a little premature. Again, totally get where you guys are going with this because I'm, I'm I'm with you. But I think at this point, we're still probably a little premature before we start start putting our hand down saying, hey, we're, we're not gonna be okay with Mike and hold on. So, so the whole point is, this is not time for public comment. So again, the whole point is, is that uh, we need to look at some of this. Now, do you guys have any other comments or thoughts? Yeah, I just feel like 
I mean, th this has been something that's talked about for months now, potentially, and they're doing their survey, like you said. This is something I, I would like to be. I guess I feel like I'd, I'd like to be proactive. I'd like to be out front of this stuff. I feel like by the time something comes down the pipe and if and if we're waiting and then all of a sudden, boom, now we have this mandate in effect. Now we're now we're behind. And so I feel like. We need to be proactive. We need to share with people because. I can imagine there's parents who are worried about whether or not this is going to happen and what they're going to do and what their next steps are. We heard tonight there's some parents talking about withdrawing their students from school. That's a serious concern and that's a lot of from what I hear in the community. That is a, a huge concern and as we lose students, we lose money, we lose funding. And so if we don't come up and be proactive and be, in my opinion, be on the forefront of this. We're, we're just going to get behind and, and lose any community support we have for anything. Again, Ron, thoughts? I think uh, getting the community informed and having them show up at these tag meetings and, and contribute to these tag meetings is then for it. That is proactive. That's how you get them going. And you do that by educating them. You, you inform them. I, I bet you there's a lot large uh, number of the community that do not know that that tag opportunity sits out there. There's a large number of the community that don't are not educated to the possibility of forced immunization. That's our goal as I'm not a teacher, but we are the education group. Educate, but don't don't need to. No, I, I won't say just educate. Just get the information out there. Get them in front of the legislators and let them know either way, either way you stand. That's to me is the goal of the school board, especially when there's a concern that affects the students and the parents in the community that we're involved with. Educate and let the legislators legislate. Yes, Gabe. I, I, I agree with what you're saying, Ron, about educating, and, and I think we have done that. I, I think there was over 7,000 people or notes submitted on this whole vaccine thing um, in that first meeting. So, so the community is getting educated on it. But the community has also elected us to be leaders, and I feel like they've elected us to be that representative of, of what they're looking for. And right now, the community is looking for us to, to stand up and take a take a position on this because they're going to want to know what to do next. The community is not they're not going to want to wait until July if something comes down the pipe and then all of a sudden scramble. The community is going to want to know what they're going to do next. And I think we need to know we need to be in front of this because if we don't and then we lose all this enrollment, we're going to lose money. If we if we don't listen to the community, we're going to have the same thing happen with the with the recent levy. So, so we need to make sure we, we start listening to, to the community members and we keep doing what we can and we've got to be forefront. We've got to be out in front of this stuff and, and at least try. I, whatever way something goes, it goes, right? We've already talked about that. It happens, it happens, we move on. But I think we need to show the community that we hear them, we're taking an action, we're moving forward. I, I'd like to answer that. I agree. But I think we're, we're talking different parts of the community. And I think that's the problem here is that we can't just make one statement and capture all of the community. That's all, all we can do is get that information out there for all the community to see. Then the communicate, community can make their, okay, what you're saying is right. We are, we're elected to educate the people on what's gonna affect the schools. They also elect legislators state senators, they legislate, they hire, that's the folks you go to and say, hey, I want this bill to go this way or the other way. This is not the time for not public comment. Not the other way. Our job is to, I, I know I'm repeating myself and I, you, you really supposed to let us know if you're recording. I don't mind being recorded, but you're supposed to. Planning for people to speak. Is that true? Yeah, really? Okay, I just asked. I just asked. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie to you, Ron. Okay, I appreciate that. 
Hey, so getting back to the point, I don't suppose, I, I'm sorry. Please go ahead. I apologize, I apologize. Um, we have both sides of the community we need to represent. And that's why we are here and we vary with our opinions and we share our thoughts and we come to a conclusion. So I appreciate what you're saying, I do. And I hear what you're saying. I do not belittle anything you're saying. I hope I'm coming across with that. But I have to share with you that there's other sides of the community that may not completely agree with what the other side says. As, as we said, uh, of the 22% that voted, it was almost 50%. And even, even to stress it even higher, one passed, one didn't to just show you how divided we are. So. Yeah. So can I make a comment, Mike? Yes, Mike. Um, you, there, there is only one way to capture the entire community, and that is to give them a choice. So yeah, what we're, <laughs> so what you're saying, I mean, respectfully, what you're saying, like, doesn't kind of make sense. What you're saying is that we can't, we, we, we want to represent both sides, and we represent both sides by not giving them the ability to choose. That doesn't make any sense. But, but what we're saying is, what we're saying is, is, is there any, I'm asking, is there any value in putting the public at ease? I mean, we're, we know they're going to be up here speaking, speaking, speaking. Is there any value saying, like, hey, hey, guys, listen, hey, when it, when, it, when it comes down to us, when it comes down the pike, our decision is going to be, you get to choose. And then, then I think feel like that eases a lot of pressure, right? Because now we say, my body, my choice, right? It's like, it's like, you know, you can't put this in my body. We're, we're giving you a choice. When it comes down, when, it, when the buck stops here, when it comes to us, our, our decision is, you guys get to choose. So, okay, what That's you, all I'm saying. Okay, what are we discussing? You just said it. You've given them a choice. We, or how, how, how are we talking different? We draft up a resolution. That's yeah, not giving them a choice. We draft up. Draft a, up a, a, I'm sorry. What, I'm, we'll just, I'm, well, I'm, you I'm, can, I'm, go ahead, finish my sentence for me. Go ahead. I, I, no, no, okay, no. I want, gentlemen, I want you both to speak politely and professionally in here, please. Okay, so I want to draft up a resolution that says that when the vaccine mandate comes, we are going to give people a choice to take it or not. Before it comes down, proact proactively. Can we, can we ask, can I ask, we ask Bronson a question? Can we answer the attorney a question? Question for you as an attorney. Do we have, um, do we have the right to drop a resolution and will it have teeth that um, that we we don't agree with being forced vaccinated and we give the community a choice? Do we, does that, do you see my question? Do we have any teeth in that? Well, if you pass a proclamation or a resolution, it's just telling the public what the will or desire of the board is. So I think what you're doing on this is because the state's considering whether to add the COVID-19 as a required immunization. So if the board, that's what the state's considering right now. And the public can get involved in that and voice their opinion on that. If the law doesn't change, because you keep talking about mandate, I think what the state's studying is, is changing the law to add COVID-19 as a required immunization. So if the law doesn't change, then people do have a, Mike is saying people have to, well, people can get their kids vaccinated or not. If the law does change and they add it to the list, then that means um, it's, the law. it's the law and the kids are required to be, get that vaccination to, to enter school. Yes, Diane. So Bronson, I have a question. Um, so a question that I asked DOH last week because the MMR is the only one that has a, a difference because it was legislated by law. The other ones were SBOH. And so Dr. Pierce may know a little bit more about that too, but I know that there's a little difference on the MMR, but we have, and that is the only one that you can't have the, the certain exemption for, is that correct? The rest of them, you have your exemptions. And so, could be exempted from this. 
That, that's correct. So right now, measles, mumps, rubella may not be exempted for personal philosophical reasons. However, it can still be exempted for religious or medical reasons. Right. So it, if, not when, but if this becomes a legislated law, um, those exemptions would still stand. I, I can't imagine that it, it, it depends on what the legislature Correct. does what they because we're, we're just trying to guess what the right. law may say right now they're just they're studying it right it would be hard to believe and I know things change but that and some exemption would not be offered uh, I, I just wanted to um, maybe ask Bronson to, to clarify the question that uh, that Mr. Valentine asked. So, and you correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's it's one thing for if the board were to say we would like to you know pass a proclamation saying we believe that parents should have a choice or something like that. However, I I, I don't think it would be legal for the board to pro to to pass a proclamation saying. that the immunizations will be uh, a choice sort of regardless of, of what's decided by law. Like you can't you can't preemptively, correct me if I'm wrong, pass a resolution and then the law if the law comes down and says nope this is what it is that the law comes. Yeah, yeah. So but but I, I'm just again providing information clarification so, so it's I think it would be about how the wording of the proclamation would and I just wouldn't want there to be any confusion about that like if the if the board just in her if the board passed a proclamation saying we believe these should be uh, optional and parent choice and then the State Department of Health and the law makes a different decision we have to follow the law. There, there's some, yeah, and that's that's right. Uh, the um, I think there's some districts around the state that pass proclamations, and essentially what it was was that they support not adding the COVID-19 vaccine to the list of required that immunizations. Is, that is right, and so then that that proclamation won't trump a law but what it, it's saying is this is the school board's desire that that law not be changed that it stay how it is right now it's advisory almost so yes Gabe. so can we in in a proclamation we can share multiple things right so we can we can say that we as a board we support those who want to go and get vaccinated, students, staff, parents, all that stuff, right? We like we encourage that if you would like to go do that. However, as a board, we don't support or agree with making it part of the, the vaccine requirements. I mean, one where we're encouraging folks like, hey, yeah, you can go do it. Like we even have clinics. However, if that's what the board can we do yeah like i like what bronson said can we do exactly what bronson just said bronson articulated it very well could we do that we can okay we can um, so what i would what i would ask mm -hmm. is we do something similar to what we did with our our proclamation we did today so let's have them draw it up because again i think we need to look at it you know because i would like more time on any or further proclamations or uh, resolutions because again whenever we do that we usually have them for first and second reading and do all kinds of stuff to make sure that we're comfortable with it again okay. all all for choice I think it's important that we have a document that we can all look at digest and you know we can certainly have it by the next meeting without any issue yes Diane. and I appreciate Bronson and staff working on this last one and giving you the time to like you said there are districts throughout the state so time to look at those, time to find them, time to share with us. So that's what I would ask is that we would have time to let staff do that. Okay. Tracy, can I ask that you you do that? Is everyone, everyone okay with that? So we're, so we're asking for two more weeks to get more information prepared on 
probably the second biggest topic that's been in the news and in our community now for months. We're, we're asking to push this two more weeks down the road so we can see what is drafted up versus basically having our own, just have, having our vote and then having Bronson go and do it. Is that I what I'm like understanding? Know, I, before we start signing documents and proclamations, I'd like to know that it's written properly, that it's in a manner that we can all agree on. I, I'm not disagreeing with the premise of this conversation. I just want to make sure that if we do this, we do it right, we do it legally, and we do it in a way that makes some sense instead of rushing this through. I understand time of the, is of the essence. I understand people's concern, but I also want to make sure that we're doing this document properly. So can I clarify so I know what yes, we're supposed to do? So is there going to be a motion from the board to direct staff to prepare a draft proclamation on the COVID-19 vaccination for board review and discussion? I move that we make a motion to the staff to draw up what Bronson just said. <laughs> I would second that. We have a first and a second. We need further discussion. Patty, can I have the roll call vote, please? I need to know what Bronson <laughs> <laughs> said. Motion to direct staff to prepare a draft proclamation regarding the uh, COVID-19 vaccinations of students. Okay, motion made by Micah and seconded by Diane. Diane. Okay. All right, um, Mr. Galbraith? Yep. Mr. Valentine? Yes. Ms. Sunvik? Yes. Mr. Mabry? Yes. Mr. Connors? Yes. Wonderful, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bronson. Okay. Uh, next on our list is board feedback, the draft KSD learner profile. Mr. Scott will be presenting. I'm in trouble. I forgot my homework. Uh, you oh. got it. Did I get one? So can I say something first? In case you didn't do it, you have an extra copy that Mr. Scott would like you to do. And do you want us just to hand them to you or how would you like to receive them? Um, so first, if you didn't do it, um, it was a homework assignment. And, uh, <laughs> I'm getting it. Getting it we'll, we'll give you an opportunity to make it up. Um, no, uh, if you certainly what we'd like to do at this point in time is is have some feedback from you if that's the desire of the board to provide um, just some overall comment um, in regards to the learner profile as was presented a couple of weeks ago and is displayed here now. Um, again, we have a committee of folks, a, a group, a work group that wants to go back and, and finalize this and then we want to do some you know, kind of graphic displays around it um, and then bring it back to you for final approval. But we want to make sure that we're capturing your impressions or if there's anything you'd like us to continue working on. So certainly um, I would love to collect those back from you. So because I, I, I'm really terrible at taking notes and talking at a podium, um, but certainly would entertain questions or clarify anything or like to hear what your your thoughts were. Could you could you review the directions again? <laughs> yellow yellow so, as you agree. Yep, yellow is questions. Yes, yellow is, uh, is it kind of resonates with you. You think it's a good thing. Um, the pink is, hey, I've got some questions about this or I, I, don't, I don't like this <laughs> or reword this or whatever. It just, it's something just to kind of draw our attention to things that we might want to think about some more. So. I, wrote, I wrote questions in on mine. That's, that's okay, right? Yeah, I actually wrote perfect, questions. Perfect, okay. yeah. Yeah, I was gonna say, I, I like the document. I just, I just had some wording changes for your group to look at, whether you take them or not, fine. Okay. Perfect. No, it's a, I, I did read through it. I left it at home no. like a knucklehead. And, and, and like I said, it's an opportunity if you'd like to have either question answered or if you'd like to share anything you can, if you just want to complete it and turn it back into Tracy, um, and then we can we can take a look from there. Um, it's not a problem either way. I just want to, you want you to know that I actually started to write a little bit of pink until you give the directions last time and I switched it, so I just want to know. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. So do you need anything from us tonight? You just would no, take these No, no, it's just, okay. it's really whatever feedback you want to get. If you want to hand those back down or like I said, get them whatever time, it's just, we'll, we'll take that 
um, along with our student feedback because it did go to the, the student advisory committee um, for their feedback again. So they, they got an actual second look at it um, and they provided some great feedback to us. And we also had a community member reach out who saw the presentation um, and provided some feedback as well. So we will take that in consideration and come back um, at a future date to show you it with, with the graphics and everything, how it will kind of be part of our strategic plan should you agree. Awesome. Thank you. This is, uh, there's a lot of work in this. I, it doesn't look like it, just with a couple pages. There's a lot of work in this, and I, I appreciate the, the people that input that information. And we're, we're excited to eventually, like I mentioned in the presentation, to take it and then, and then implement it in a way that we can be, you know, looking at our curriculum, looking at, 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 at instructional practices, looking at structures in our district to make sure that we're, we're meeting the needs of students as outlined in the learning program. Exactly. Yeah, I just wanted to say um, to highlight that I appreciate that how much you've engaged students in this process and um, both the superintendent student advisory council and, and other methods. So just you're doing a great job in that regard and students really seem to appreciate the way it's done and the wording. So overall a resounding good job from what I've heard from students and same from myself. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Great. Thank you, Matt. Okay, next on our list is reports and discussions. Uh, we're going to go to the capital budget update and Mr. Roberts is going to give us the update. numbers here you probably a steady dose of that <laughs> the next three months or so that's okay but uh, we're in the capital fund not the general fund so uh, no uh, you know good news still in the capital fund and uh, I'm gonna go through a little history here first uh, you know this goes back to a presentation that was done uh, October 28 2018 it was presented to the board uh, at that time as uh, the bond was being developed and how much the bond you know should be presented to voters you can see the 125 million at the bottom there that is what you know was eventually presented to voters in 2019. you can see the projects so the estimated cost uh you know at the time those didn't go out to bid so we try to get uh you know estimates and, and get as close as we can so kennewick high is projected to come in a little below now this is all the cost this is cost for construction architect engineering furniture equipment and uh, that's the all-in cost honest dot phase two is a little below um, what, what that estimate was Ridgeview to be determined that's going to go out for bid uh, you know May or June May June of, of the spring and then uh, elementary 18 so at this time there are no plans to build any new schools, uh, elementary, we uh, enrollment's down. We're not eligible for any match money based on the formula, based on enrollment. There's just no real, um, uh, there's no no plans, probably uh, projections, that anything's gonna happen anytime soon. Property acquisition, uh, we did buy some property. At the time this was done, property was not as expensive and over the past couple of years, the prices did go up, the cost went up. And fortunately, we did still buy at a pretty good time. And uh, we'll talk about that in, uh, in a few other slides. Capital improvements, we haven't been doing as much just because we had all these projects, Kennewick High, Southridge, Kamayak, and Ridgeview. Those are really the priorities to, to make sure we had enough money to do those. Uh, Kamayak, and you see that uh, estimate, Southridge. Uh, the reason that went higher is because after this was done, uh, the board approved the HVAC to replace that HVAC system there. Uh, that was six to seven million dollars. <throat> and in the state assist assistance column, so we try to estimate, uh, you know, how much based on the formula we'll get. Uh, very close on Kennewick High and, and some of these other projects. Uh, Ridgeview, I think there was wishful thinking that the state would change their formula, uh, and there was talk of that uh, at that biennium budget process, but that never did happen. Uh, we're estimating 9.5 million. Uh, we're not eligible for any new space. We, the formula says we have plenty of, of square footage based on our enrollment and based on uh, the, the computations. 
and then we don't get match money for property or capital improvements. And you can see the match uh, state assistance that we uh, are receiving on the Kamayak and the Southridge projects. And uh, you know, the Southridge project, the HVAC is not a state matchable part of that project. It all deals with the instructional square footage. So, so any questions there? I think the net of this, you know, if you add these up and these, I mean, we're probably, uh, I think it's around $10 million, you know, uh, in the, the negative. Uh, some of the co costs of the projects were a little higher, like Southridge and some of the match, excluding the elementary 18, was a little lower. Oh. Yes, ma'am. So on the high schools, are, is that hard? That's the last money? We know that that's coming No, in. we're still getting, we still have costs coming in okay. on the high schools. So yeah, this is still kind of a projection here. Um, we still have some costs coming in here. So that's pretty much done, maybe a little bit here, but probably the most we have left is Kennewick High. As you can see, they're still doing the, the north side where all the dirt is, got to put some fields in and things like that. Okay, so that just gives you the history and you know, it's good to kind of look back, see, uh, see how we did. And uh, you know, all in all, uh, pretty well. And then uh, more history here on what you know we've done the last two or three years, uh, three or four years, using uh, K3 grant and our bond money, some of the, the projects and some of the costs that, uh, you know, those type of projects, you know, the, uh, use our money. So, you know, Amon Creek, Ferreira, uh, you know, over 20 million. We, we think Ridgeview is gonna be probably 30 million all in or more. Um, some of these other projects, the Tri-Tech that came in, we renovated uh, the old Desert Hills for mid, uh, MCP uh, Legacy. You know, we purchased that property down there and uh, renovated that church for Legacy, that, that building. And the two Amistad projects were done in phases. And that, that school's quite a bit bigger than our other schools, so total cost there was a little more. Uh, we purchased two elementary sites, and we can show you those. We've done that over the last two or three years. Uh, middle school, high school site, 80 acres on top of Riata. <clears throat> and then uh, Tritech finished up their project, the core growth. You can you know, drive by there and see that. And a few other little property, a uh, piece of property there. It was Kennewick High, the Southridge. We just mentioned we're waiting on Ridgeview. Uh, we're looking at, uh, we have quotes. We're gonna change out the lamps and stadium lighting. So. With Kennewick High and with Kamayak, when we put in those turf fields, the lighting is LED and it, it doesn't light pollute and you can really dial it down. And lamps and uh, light fixtures are pretty much at the end of their useful life. And um, there is lamps and has a foundation and they said they would contribute to, to uh, change those out. So uh, that will happen this summer. And LEDs are less expensive to run. Oh yes, yeah, yeah, less, exactly. Yeah. And you don't have to replace them as often. Kamaya can re-roof, there is a building there that uh, leaks and it uh, is uh, on our list and that'll be done and it'll be around $350,000. And we'd also like to look at the Southridge athletic field lighting. That's another one. Uh, you know, there's a lot of light pollution there. A lot of residential has been built there, you know, since those fields were put in. So we're going to get some quotes on that and see what that looks like. And then uh, Kamaya and flooring is another big project that's uh, you know, we did Southridge over the last two or three years, and Kamayakin is, uh, you know, we'll be looking at, you know, trying to phase that in or seeing what that costs. Another area there is the road and utility costs. So when we buy a school district property and it's developed and they put a road in, we have to pay our share. And the Riata property, the, the property on top of Riata is probably, they're going to probably start, you know, developing or, you know, that for residential. And we're going to, have to pay probably up to two million dollars on our share of the roads that border that property and uh, some of the infrastructure water lines and things so uh, that will be a placeholder in the capital budget and there's a placeholder there now but as we budget next year you'll see that we'll be putting in a couple million dollars in there for that so anyway that gives you some of the bigger projects that, that we've done and these are the sites that i mentioned here's the the 81 acre you know, it's basically, you could build a middle and high school combination on there. And, you know, there's not gonna be anything needed there for, for many, many years, but you have to buy property pretty uh, early in the process, years before you really need a school. Otherwise, there's no opportunities to buy, the price goes up and you get in a, a bind. So this is here at the top of uh, Riata. Here's the property 
they'll be able, they'll uh, develop roads here to get to property over here that will be residential and over here. And then this is the elementary site on top of Riata. And there's plans to, uh, this is all platted out and I'm surprised it hasn't really started yet, but that, that will probably be happening in the next year or so. So those are the, those two properties. The two other properties we purchased in the last couple of years are uh, elementary site in the Bob Olson Parkway area. That's about uh, 16 acres. And uh, there's a site here that used to be an iron horse as it came to town. So that's why that's termed that. But uh, it's right behind the um, irrigation dam up there that you see behind Canyon Lakes. And there, there could be some cost with that property down here as the state is building the underpass. And so that will uh, hopefully get development going out here. This is all going to be residential. And there could be some drainage and some things that we have to share the cost in as that uh, proceeds. Probably not anytime real soon, but could be the next uh, year, year or two. So anyway, that's a little update there on those those sites. And then just some other costs, the capital fund, just to give you an idea, you know, tracks were pretty much done with that. And those were a couple million dollars. Uh, we did some tennis court resurfacing up there at Southridge uh, this summer, fall. There were some the Kamaya can practice field irrigation, pump house, uh, water type stuff has been a problem for years and that was finished up last summer. And the other high cost areas, and I kind of put down, we do use the general fund, uh, you know, up to, it can be up to three or $400,000. We, we can charge to the general fund on some projects and then, you know, it's a little flexible. We can use the capital fund too, the larger projects, definitely. The cost to rebuild the middle school, at least a million dollars. We have a couple middle schools that, um, you know, we, we'd like to get to, but, um, you know, we're holding off on that for a little bit. Cost to re-roof of elementary is $500,000. We're pretty caught up on that. And then some of these other ones, you know, parking lots, HVAC systems are very expensive. The lighting change outs I talked about, security systems, <laughs> access control. Uh, we're looking at replacing some reader boards. So we have a lot of schools where that's a, that's a big ticket item and it's hard for them to, uh, you know, fund that. Uh, playground structures, we've held off. We went up to about uh, 2019. We were re replacing quite a few or, or putting new ones in. And those are very expensive. I, I have a slide there, but I think Canyon View, uh, they didn't have any new structures for years. It cost $400,000 to get two uh, large play structure areas there. And uh, flooring, so I mentioned Southridge over a couple years, we, we knocked that out, $1.2 million. So if you go in Southridge and you see all that new flooring, that's that's what it costs. Painting of schools, uh, we're pretty caught up on that. Uh, track resurfacing, so we're caught up on that, but it's all gonna come to a head in 10 years when you know all our tracks uh, <laughs> need some work. Uh, portable moving, we have three portables at Ridgeview that need to get moved. And those cost ten to $15,000 to move one portable, and then we have to set them up. So we're probably looking at uh, $50,000 to $100,000 to spend on moving those portables and siting them at another school. I just have a question, like, how, do, how does this process work? Because all these bids seem, like, insanely high. Do you, how did you take three bids or four bids or look at them all? Or how, like, oh, how yeah, does that there's, so there's work? bid rules. Uh, these bigger track ones, they have to go through an RFP process. Uh, then it comes back to the board to approve, but it's a formal bid process for those. Mm -hmm. And then other smaller ones, you so have the to- the board just approves whichever bid they like the best? Is that how that works? Well, you have to take the lowest bid unless you have a good reason why okay. not. So generally it's lowest bid. And then uh, projects that are, yeah. are uh, you know, over 300,000, you use a small works roster and you have to get three quotes. Uh, you know, smaller projects, uh, generally, we try to keep the board informed of you know what's going on with projects through weekly update and things and, and uh, but there are uh, bid rules uh, so the portal moving that's going to come up we're working on that and then uh, fleet equipment replacement we are working on probably uh, close to eighty to a hundred thousand dollars on replacement uh, a mower 16 foot mower and a tractor that pulls that you know since we've added uh, Chinook Amon Creek and these different schools, we have not really updated our mower fleet. Uh, one of the things they would say, you know, basically, you know, why do you need this, this? 
uh, you know, we want to try to do efficiency. We don't want to have to add another staff person. If we got a mower that can do twice the work, then we don't have to do that. And uh, it is something we haven't addressed for for a while. So it gives you an idea. Just a, a lot of uh, big ticket items uh, come up, and we try to do the best we can. So then, moving into the capital projects fund, um, I'm going to go over here. You know, we have the actual from 2021. That's done. We ended up with uh, $42.7 million. The money that comes into this fund is from the bond, uh, the, the bonds that are passed, and the state match money we get on projects. That's how uh, the capital fund gets, gets the resources. Uh, the budget for 21-22, and we do this, uh, you know, in, in the spring or you know, March, April, May, and you see it's $13.6 million. And we only had match money budget of $9 million. So we're going to get 23 million, and that is because we didn't get as much match money in 2021 for timing. We got to send stuff in. We thought we were going to get 55 million here. We got 41, and we never did get the 55. So this went down. Uh, you know, the budget 21, 22. We thought we were going to get 55 million. We didn't get it, and uh, nine million. So we low, but we're going to get our money this year because we didn't bill for it the year before. So it's actually going to be 23 million because you know, we didn't get we didn't get that money here. We should have got to say 56 if we were on uh, schedule. The construction costs came in. We turned it in. Construction construction costs were a little later. So we turned it in. Later. So anyway, 13.6 budget, 27.7. We're going to get that match money we didn't get back that we budgeted in 2021. And then here's some of the projects you know, that were budgeted or the placeholders. And pretty close on a lot of these. Here's the land, uh, you know, property acquisition. This is basically the money held for the roads, uh, share of the infrastructure on some of those projects where they might be developing next to our land. Uh, I don't think we're going to, you know, we only have till August for this budget. That's when it ends. So I have 500,000 here. We would have to budget at least 2 million in case, you know, okay, KSD, you got to pay for your share of the road at Riata. And those come up and then uh here's the remaining on some of these projects you know pretty close budget wise but you know we have time to, to kind of hone in on that since uh where we're at now 5.2 million left on kennewick high southridge 3 million uh ridgeview you know, we're starting architect costs there won't be a lot of construction costs yet there could be a little bit in the summer that uh, gets charged to the 21 22 budget Asset preservation is more of a placeholder for anything that comes up where we might have to use some funds for uh, roofing, flooring, things like that. And then generally we put a contingency in the budget, $5 million, just in case there is an HVAC system goes out and we need to spend two or $3 million. Uh, it doesn't look like that's going to get used. So, you know, I kind of adjusted that down. But when we do the budget again, there will be probably a contingency amount that we set in there just so we don't have to come back and do a budget amendment in case you know some emergency comes up and we need to apply some funding and then the the it the tech levy that was passed uh we budget the revenue in and we budget the revenue out it's more of an offset so it doesn't uh you know um, make it look like there's more money in the fund than there is so generally that's uh so projections there uh 27.7 million of revenue 15.5 million of expenses the change there, 12.2 million. And there is some money being transferred in that was budgeted for Tritech to, uh, you know, work on building a storage, uh, different uh, facility for uh, teaching classes. And that's what Paul's gonna talk about after this presentation. Uh, and then some of the money in here is actually Tritech's money. And some of it is the, the tech levy money that uh, is still held there. So if you take about 5.5 million off for, you know, Tritex money and tech levy money, 50.4 million is where we project to end up in August. And, and then we would you know, do another budget. But here's generally what we would look at. And the budget, like I said, would probably add a contingency amount. Uh, there's the Ridgeview match money, 7 million, and then 2.5, the 9.5 million we expect to get. Now we may not get all this 7 million in 22, 23. It may not come until 23, 24. And then the tech levy uh, continue. Actually, this should be adjusted up. They passed the levy, the voters did. This would be 4.25 million and 4.5 million and then an offset and so on. 
the Ridgeview project. Uh, we expect to spend some money this year on architect services, and maybe some construction, and then I think this totals about 30 million. And so we'll wait for what that uh, bid comes in at, and then that'll be, you know, projected out in terms of the cash flow and and how much of that gets paid in 22-23 and 23-24. And then uh, this is another placeholder that would be budgeted for uh, you know, roofs, things like that that come up. And like I said, we we really have kind of not spent a lot of money on other projects out of this fund, just because we're focused on Southridge, Kamayak, and Kenwick High, uh, those projects. And the, the plan has always been um, that this fund would have enough money to build elementary 18. That was the original bond plan. So to have enough money to do that, you need the plan was 25 to 30 million dollars. And then you, you do get match on that. If you build a new elementary, you'd expect to get matched, although we don't qualify. But that was the original plan. So we'd still like to, to end up with 25 to 30 million here. And then it would be up to the board to you know figure out, okay, what do we do with that? If we do another bond, do we apply that to another project in that bond? You know, it's because a, a middle school to redo is going to cost, say, $60 million. You know, do you save some money here and apply that? So over, over the, the next few years, that'll be discussed. And then things could come up where, you know, there's a big ticket item and uh, it's needed. The board decides, yeah, we want to apply that money. So anyway, that kind of gives you a little bit to there of uh, current where we're at and then uh, some projections there. Uh, Tritech does want to... Uh, build some instructional space. They do have, a, I think, two or three million down here is Tritex money. It, they do not have enough to do that whole project. There is enough money here to, to, you know, kick in two or three million and have them pay that back. And we could, and as you can see, the projections, you know, we, we still would be in, in good shape. So I think that's it. Any questions on, on this? This is, a, you know, kind of a little simple version here of the capital fund. But uh, definitely open for any questions. Just get Vic, real quick, um, on the slide up on high cost projects, said bus purchases, transportation funds. So, is the the state gives us the funds to replace our buses? Is that am I understanding that yeah, correctly? So and then we go out and purchase new buses right, with right. air conditioning and all right. that stuff. Right. So that's out of the transportation fund, not out of the the capital fund or general fund. We get okay. uh, uh, money based on the number of buses, and they have a formula that figures out the depreciation on the buses. And we've been getting about seven to eight hundred thousand dollars a year, which will buy five buses or so. Um, and we've already ordered the buses. I think we approved it this fall, if I remember, uh, to, to arrive uh, August or September. Okay. And um, in the past, we have transferred some money from the general fund to the transportation fund uh, because we were really in need of, of more buses than the state had funded. But we we haven't done that for several years. We haven't seen a need to do that. Thanks. Yes, Anything else? On the um, playground, and I know you know we have kind of put that away. Um, the ones that you're talking about, and they are very expensive. Are those ADA compliant? Yeah, as far as I know, they they're part of. Uh, we go through KCDA, so as far as I know, they're all ADA compliant. Yeah. Can can you find that I out for me and, and just yeah. let me know? Thank you. you Not that I don't believe you, but yeah, I mean, I, I would expect sure. they should be, but I'll double check it and get back to you. Because sometimes what people say does not meet the yeah. letter of the law, so yeah. I just want to make sure they're paying a lot of money. Well, and then we, we had to retrofit some when they said they are, so I, I mm -hmm. just want to make sure we're not having yes. to spend money later. Thank you. Very, very good comment. Uh, uh, so here's some. Any other questions there? Nope, they can good. Okay, so here's some of the islands track, 2.3 million. Uh, you know, it was cost a little more than the other tracks. There was just a lot more challenges on that site, a lot of dirt to move. But, uh, you know, it, it, it turned out, we're going to try to green it up like that, uh, you know, since over the winter it's lost its color. And then here you see Canyon View Playground. Uh, these are expensive items. This one, uh, and it gets expensive. You have to sometimes lay, lay asphalt and put tile on top. These were probably, this one was probably a little more cost. Than this one, but the total there, and Kenny did not have very good playground toys. I mean, it had to be addressed. And uh, 445,000. That's the last one we did. You can see some of the schools have have been upgraded, and some are still uh, going to be on the list to try to knock out as we kind of make sure we do ridge view and some things. And we do have some playground toys coming for ECAP because we've moved a couple portables over there, our early childhood center. 
and those little kids need some some toys and ecap has some money but we'll help with that and it's probably 50 to 100 thousand dollars and i'm going to hand it over to paul that must be my cue. paul you've been waiting <laughs> you, so long up. i hope you didn't forget your presentation <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. all right all right we're going to talk oh, about the no, no. tritech expansion plan and mr randall's going to present thanks Vic. all righty so talk a little bit about the programming need for tritech we have a good problem to solve. Um, two of our programs, Prevet Tech and Pre Electrical, have just grown. Uh, the Prevet Tech we put, uh, we started in the mid 2000s. Um, in 2005, we built some space out. It was too small. Um, we now know, and it's been a perennial um, high student demand program. We started Pre Electrical two years ago, um, and it exploded as far as student enrollment. Uh, so in both of these uh, program areas, they are in our 2005 edition, which I'll show you in a slide later, which is not eligible for state capital funds until 2035, which is a long time away. So what we're, uh, this shows you a little bit about the enrollment um, uh, and projections for it. They both exceed our, our school average of 19.5 uh, per session, 21.3 for the pre-vet tech, 24 and a half for the uh, pre-electrical. Uh, last year, we had 111 applications for 54 spots in pre-electrical at 84 applications for pre-vet tech. And so we, in the current configuration, cannot fit the kids in there, uh, even if we have them go like this, you know. Um, so the it got good, solid history and good, solid demand for those two programs. This is TriTech right now, and um, you can see the uh, where they're located. Um, the pre, both of those in our expansion from 2005. And the idea is to use existing open space on our TriTech East campus. We're very familiar with the space. We own the space. It's, you know, flat dirt and, and we've got water and sewer and everything uh, power out there. So that is a proposed location. Uh, TriTech is, is overseen by a superintendent's council that approves a long range plan. We met today. This is, was approved by the eight superintendents that thought, yeah, this is at least something that we should look and, and explore going into just so we can look at expand pro, expanding programming. Um, this is a very etch-a-sketch schematic design. We bought it on the lowdown, you know, very inexpensive, but this kind of shows you the, the 9,500 square feet for those two programs. It's not fancy. It's very um, simple and utilitarian, nice, you know, rectangle there. It's not like the front of TriTech with the beautiful uh, red sails and glass and, and stuff like that. It's a nice simple structural building to solve our problem. Um, the space that we vacate from pre-vet tech, so that 1,600 square feet and the uh, TriTech uh, on the core campus, we are looking at putting in a medical assistant pro assisting program. There's huge growth and so that space would work well for medical assisting, but doesn't work well for pre-vet tech. So we would be able to uh, add a, a, a medical assisting program. We also explored uh, pre-pharmacy tech. And looking at those two programs, medical assistant is, assisting is the, the leading program that we will explore. The vacated space from pre-electrical, which is about 2,000 square feet, uh, a reasonable sized classroom with a, a small shop area, we could start an HVAC-R program, heating, ventilation, air conditioning, and refrigeration program. We think that that will be a slow-growing program over time, but because um, uh, pre-electrical literally exploded. I mean, it just went with it. And so we think that this would be a good um, uh, space for HVAC-R. We might get some jobs with the other, you know, work on some of the buildings here if the HVAC <laughs> system goes down. Uh, who knows? <laughs> we could we could, we could <laughs> work something out here, you know? Um, so here's the estimated cost. And Vic, you want to talk a little bit about kind of the plan? Mr. Randall, if I may oh, interrupt yes. here real quick, just, just so I don't lose my train of thought here. So right now, the, the pre-vet tech has how many square feet? About 1,695. And it will go to? So it would go to right around 32, 3,400 square feet. OK, so we're doubling the size. And pre-electrical is going to be something similar? So pre-electrical, we are running it in our construction program space right now. And it is around 4,000 square feet of shop space with a very small classroom. 
So this is replicating the shop space and, and we're being really efficient. We're not putting lockers or built-ins or anything like that. So we're stretching the space there. And then uh, the size of the classroom is about 1,200 and uh, so feet. Uh, so we're expanding the classroom. You see these squares in the pre-electrical area right mm -hmm. here. Those represent 10 by 10 pads or huts. And those are the little buildings that the students use right there. That's a wall. She's putting a service on, on the uh, one of the huts. And so we think with that layout, we'll be able to meet our need. OK, right. wonderful. Thank you. Any other questions before I run off? I well, my question is like, how many students do you want to have? Because it seems like there's a big demand and now you're expanding and it seems like it's not going to meet that demand even when you expand this, right? So, so, so is, that, is that because you want to kind of turn down a few students to keep it exclusive or, you know, I mean, just kind of how does that work? So uh, are you talking about tri-tech capacity? Yeah. So right now we can fit 1,050 kids theoretically in tri-tech. For each program that is two sessions, we add 54 more students. So that put us at 1,150-ish, 60-ish students if we add medical assisting and HIR at capacity. If we look at pre-vet tech and we want to expand and meet that student demand, we would have to find staffing for it. And that is the struggle right now, is to find someone to teach a half-time session so we could, uh, in this configuration, we could put a teacher and a half in there, maybe two teachers, um, it, but we finding that teacher, uh, pre-vet tech te teacher was very, we, we hired an instructional assistant and it, we spent months looking for an instructional assistant. Pre-electrical, the <coughs> space is better, why do we have to move pre-electrical? It is now housed in our construction program. Most of our construction happens at the Habitat for Humanity site in Pasco. Well, what's going on is Habitat only has about a year's worth of dirt in Pasco before they have to move to Benton City. Now to transport our city, our students to Benton City is not gonna, that, that would, they'd burn up a lot of time on a bus to go to a building site for a two and a half hour session. So we have to plan ahead to put construction trades back at TriTech in their space that pre-electrical is using right now. So we're playing that little tile game of moving programs around. And so with construction trades coming back on campus, uh, we have to find a home for pre-electrical. So this solves that problem. I didn't explain that very well to begin with. Did that answer your question yeah. about capacity? Are, yeah. yeah. Oh, I was gonna say, are, are we, once we, if we do this, we build this out and then we fill the classes, are we going to already have 54 students on the wait list again to now have to figure out how to accommodate them? Like, is this, you know, it's like building a new school and then we have to throw four portables out there within a year or two. So is this like a long term, like how far out is this going to suffice the enrollment? So um, for pre-electrical, pre-vet tech, I think this will help us get there. Um, the staffing is the larger issue, but right. this, Facility-wise, I think we're making a dent in it. Um, the, as far as building out in the future, um, you know, who only knows, we have a 10-year plan, which includes some expansion on the, the Tritech East property again, but that's not till 27, 29, and those are state capital dollars, not local dollars at that point. Okay. Thank you. Okay, right. I think we're ready for Thank a bit. Oh, Thank you. <laughs> I guess I'm sitting right here. <laughs> so we kind of went over some of this. Uh, Paul's estimated cost is 4.9 million. Um, you know, going back to what I presented before, you know, all those projects and costs. I say, are you kidding me on all of the costs? <laughs> and and you know, are you kidding me? It's going to cost that much. So we try to vet those things and you know, go to bid and do whatever. So he'll have to put it out for bid and, uh, you know, hopefully it comes in lower. That's always, always a good thing. Um, so anyway, Tritech, they, they say, you know, Paul to contribute two to 2.5 million. I don't want to, you know, use up all my money. Uh, uh, can the capital fund help? Uh, I went to the presentation uh, and Tritech would pay it back uh, over a three or four year period or, uh, or sooner if, uh, you know, Paul and I have a little sit down and he's got good enrollment. Uh, impact on the capital fund. Uh, there's adequate funding is uh, for Ridgeview project. We went over that. Uh, the priority is Ridgeview. 
Uh, there's no other large scale projects planned where, you know, $5 million, $10 million uh, would go out the door. Uh, adequate funding remains to address smaller scale projects over the next three years. Uh, you know, we we have been fortunate the last uh, couple years and this year to be able to use the general fund a little bit for some of those uh, smaller projects, but still uh, six figure projects. You know, with a plan, we'd like to have at least 25 million in there probably uh, at the end of the next two or three years, just to kind of stay with that intent of the bond that was passed uh, to voters. And, um, you know, I, I explained funding was to be earmarked for elementary school 18. Uh, there is no plans to do anything building a new school in the near future. Um, so we feel pretty good about uh, being able to to help with this uh, project. Uh, it, it looks like a really good use of funds and good for the TriTech program. So unless there's any any issues with that, we would uh, proceed uh, with Paul, you know, getting a bid out and uh, using some of the capital funds to, to help move this along. Yes, Nick. So do you, and I, I, I don't have a full understanding of how TriTech's funded, so maybe that's the issue, um, but, uh, does the other districts that utilize TriTech, are they contributing to it as well or? Okay. There we go. Thank you. Any other questions? I, I wanna thank you for looking at the HVAC-R and MA program, because we know those are two of the largest growing, you know, I know, but not everybody maybe knows, MA is the largest growing medical group and um, I know you have people begging you to do this. And so thank you for doing that because that's good for our medical community, certainly. But it's also good for our students getting out there and walking out the door at 18 with, well, I know there's a thing about their licensure, but that will happen. And they can walk out the door at 18 with, with a good job. That's a, some people may stay in that, but that's a starting job. And that's what my daughter did. And so you CNA, MA, LPN, RN, MSRN. And you work your way up. And so th these are great go to work right away, shovel ready. Not really, hopefully they're not shoveling, but the same thing in HVACR. Holy moly, that's a huge job. And those are living wage, family wage jobs right out of your door. So I, I appreciate that very much. And I know that our union people are working with you and the skills people, and some of them are very, very excited about this too. So we'll move this along and uh, what's the timeline for going out for bids? And so um, we will move forward uh, as quickly as possible with an uh, architect right now to get this drawn. Uh, the, it would probably go out to bid sometime in August, September, uh, in time frame, maybe October of this coming year, um, 22, mm -hmm. and then building from 22. Our goal is to open it in the fall of 23. So, uh, and unless there's any issues, we're gonna gonna move forward with getting things moving along. Tracy, do you have? Something? Oh, I, I was just trying to make sure that anybody who's listening from home heard what Mr. Randall said. No. So I was just trying to get you to go to the mic, but it's okay. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. Thanks. Gentlemen, thank you both very thank much. You. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. Next on our agenda is special education program update and inclusionary practices. Uh, Mr. Scott will be rejoining us. Okay. Okay, good evening again. Um, so I'm going to be um, doing some presenting along with our Director of Special Services, Lexi uh, Bushback. Um, on uh, just kind of giving you an update on special education um, uh, within the district. Um, and I just want to start just just with a quick note that, you know, um, we serve, you know, 2,300 students or more with special education and 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 the district really recognizes um, with with a lot of intensity, it recognizes that this has been a really rough two years for our families and our students. And I think that um, you know, what we want to highlight here is some things we're trying to do in regards to meeting those needs, but I just want to acknowledge that, that it's been really challenging. And it's been really challenging for our staff 
to do the things they need to do to provide services for our kids. And I just I just want to recognize that because it is it's just been really challenging. So um, as we get into the, the report, um, I do want to just kind of tie it back into our strategic goals um, and it and special education really covers all three of our student goals. Um, very, you know, very closely um, covering this is where I was making changes and probably didn't get it saved. <laughs> um, very good as we're looking at our students being ready for their future. You know, our students with special education or just like any other student in the district needing to graduate, graduate with a specialized plan for what's going to happen after they're 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 done with their education with us. Um, all of our students, we want to meet all four of those those goals with all of our students in terms of being engaged learners. Um, and then the last one with students being safe, known and valued again, all three of those apply to all of our special education students. Um, and that's really the work that people do uh, throughout the district. Um, we also um, want to make sure that we're um, meeting our annual objectives. And so when we have inclusionary practices within the title of this presentation, um, that's really what we wanted to work on. Um, so that's um, number six on our annual objectives. And then we also um, want to make sure that we're taking a look and measuring our inclusion rate. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that um, in a few seconds. So we're going to give you a quick overview of special education programs just by way of reminder and also information um, for new board members. We want to make sure that we are um, updating you on, on what we're doing around um, how the rate of inclusion for students with special needs in our district. And we also want to describe the strategic efforts that we are, are providing, um, particularly around behavioral supports, because we've had um, community members and staff members address the board um, and I know you receive emails from time to time and so we want to talk a little bit about what we're doing around behavior um, and then I forgot to add it in here but we also wanted to give a quick um, a quick update on parent involvement and what we're doing with our CPAC group so um, again when we when we look at our special education programs we're constantly developing them we're constantly trying to work to make them more um, adequate in meeting our needs of our students and families um, and OSPI is also doing that and OSPI has really said about um, looking at improving the outcomes for our students with disabilities um, in a variety of areas. And, and really what all of these areas are really getting at is how do we increase our expectations um, for our students? Um, how do we not lower the bar for them because they deserve a quality education and they deserve to have a future as well? Um, and what are we doing in all of these areas to address that? But that's really what all of these uh, priorities are about, is about uh, increasing the um, outcomes for students um, with disabilities. Um, we have some beliefs, um, probably, you know, interdepartmental, but also district wide to, to really guide the development of our programs. And it's really important to keep these things in mind. So first and foremost, all of our students are basic education funded students first. And that's just a way to say that they're they're students in our in our schools. They're not they are not special education students first. They're students um, and that they all come to us needing to be provided with supports and instruction to meet their needs. Um, and that's the role of special education. We also have, as you'll see, and when I talk about our continuum of services, we have programs that are um, located throughout our schools and students are, are placed within those programs to meet their needs. And we really want there always to be a consistent effort to make sure that those program students are students of the school that they attend. And so we've done some things over the years to make sure that students could stay in their elementary school for the entire time that they're there. They are students at those schools and that's where that's that's a major focus. And then the last part is really how we collaborate within our program. Um, general education teachers are really considered to be the experts within their content areas. They know their they know what they're teaching. They know the standards. They know those things. And our special education teachers role is really to be the experts in how we accommodate and provide supports for our special education students. And that collaboration needs to be there to provide for the needs of students in, in inclusive settings, particularly so. Um, that's those are some of the beliefs that kind of guide us when we're developing and improving programs in our district. So just some numbers for you, not quite the in-depth numbers that Mr. Roberts likes to give you. However, um, we do have about 2380 students sir, being served in our district from ages three to 21. This is a breakdown of staff for you because so you can kind of see how many staff are employed within special education um, and special education staff are located or they, they work in every one of our of our 30 plus sites. Um, in our continuum of services, it's kind of important to remember, and we like to use tiers for a lot of different things in our district, so it kind of can get a little confusing sometimes. But we're, we look at our continuum of services, we're really looking at, you know, our tier one students are really students who are 
our resource students. So they're students who have reading disabilities or, or, or writing disabilities or math disabilities, learning disabilities in those regards, or other disabilities that can be really served at their home boundary school with support from special education staff there. Our tier two programs are really designed to be those programs need that for students who have more specific and more maybe more some more intense needs, but are still able to be out in, to, in the general education environment with their peers to some degree. Some it's a little bit shorter, some it's most of the day, but that's really what we're talking about when we're talking about tier two. And those programs are generally with autism and with behavior. Our tier three are, are programs where they're more self-contained programs. Students may spend a little bit more time being educated with their, with their um, disabled peers um, based on their unique needs. And so those are really more, we sometimes could refer to those as, as, uh, as our self-contained programs. So you can see that we have, you know, our tier, our tier one resources in every one of our buildings. Um, we have tier two in 14 um, classrooms around the district and our tier three is in 30 classrooms around the district. And we try to spread them out across our community so the students can attend school as close to home, if not in their home school as they can. When we talk about inclusion and inclusion rate, it's important to, to understand first what we're talking about in terms of inclusion, um, because inclusion is really the belief and practice that all students are going to be educated um, you know, meaningfully, um, that they're gonna have access to their academics and social opportunities um, that all students get in their general education setting to the greatest extent possible, um, just based on student need. When we talk about LRE, um, we're, talking about, we're really talking about least restrictive environment. Um, and we use that data um, and, and we develop a measure of the percent of the school day that the student is with a, with a disability is being educated with non-disabled peers in the general education setting. So we do calculations of minutes. It drives our special education teachers nuts because it's a lot of work to do that, but we calculate minutes. And so really this is the breakdown. So it could be considered an LRE one student. You'd be educated with your non-disabled peers 80 to 100% of the day. LRE two, there is 40 to 79% and LRE three is placed in general education, maybe not at all or up to 39%. We're most interested in the number of our students who are served within that LRE one because we believe that most of our students, we should be giving them more access to the core curriculum and their, and their genetic peers to the extent that they're able. And those students that are needing to be placed within an LR3 are usually students who have really significant needs that make it really not beneficial to them or to their peers to be educated. It just doesn't make any sense to, to have them in that setting. Their needs are more unique and, and are, better, are better provided within those other settings. So we realize that, that our goal is really to, to move as many kids as we can into LRE2 and, and, and particularly in LRE1. And so that's where we're kind of really focusing on um, with our, uh, with our um, objectives and, and our goals. So this is kind of a historical viewpoint of inclusion rate over time over the last four years, showing you a state comparison and then where the Kenwick School District is. Um, so um, the state, and with those priorities that I demonstrated or kind of showed you before is also focused on this. You can see the increase that we've had at the state level, and this is just taking a look at all students um, in the state um, and, and the percentage of students with special education who are qualified for special education who are receiving um, their education with their genetic peers. When we started back in 2018, really trying to focus on this, we had about 45.8%. We've increased that pretty modestly to 49%. Um, and so we're continuing to do some efforts. And I'm going to talk about that in just a second about what we're doing with that. Um, and you'll see that we just have a, we have a, a, a little bit higher percentage in the LRE2 than the state. And then that our, our LRE3s are a little bit higher as well. And so again, the goal is really to move the LRE2s to LRE1 if it makes sense and, and, to, and to have kind of an upward migration there. If you add up all these percentages, you'll find that it adds up to about 98% because there are about 2% of our students who are placed in other settings rather than kind of these traditional classroom settings. So these might be students who are who are homebound. These might be students who are being served um, in private schools um, and, and those types of things. So there are, they don't add up to 100%, but, but that's the, kind of the notation on that. So what are we doing to kind of try to impact these percentages? So we've, over the last several years, we've done a lot with professional development. We've, we've done a lot with our folks to help them. There are really three main efforts that are underway right now in the district. One is really, and they're all somewhat interrelated, 
Um, one, the first one is really that we're, we're focusing on how do we develop within our, our teachers the ability to provide universal design for learning. And that really is an approach to teaching that really is, is working to assist teachers with the development of the ability to, to provide a higher degree of differentiation for student needs within the classroom by looking at providing multiple means for engaging them in their learning. So it's not just, you know, kind of sit, listen to the lecture, take notes. There's other ways that we're conveying information to students and conveying the what is being taught um, or, or engaging them in that. Then there are multiple ways for teachers to represent the what is being taught. So it's not, again, just putting something on up on a, on a, a, a whiteboard. It may be providing information in different modalities to students and then giving students multiple means of demonstrating. So maybe you know, moving beyond pencil paper to do different ways, having students provide different ways, particularly in light of their disabling conditions, you know, to provide them an opportunity to show their learning in ways that make sense. And so if we can do that, and if we can help with that differentiation of, of instruction within the gen ed classroom, then it'll make it more accessible to students. Um, and then I highlighted some of the schools where there have been efforts in that to some degree or another, um, and, they're, and they're all kind of varied, um, but in terms of trying to provide that type of learning. Then we also have special education teachers that are providing in-class student supports, so they're not pulling them into a special education setting, they're going in with the students um, to provide support for them within the gen ed classrooms, and that's really happening, again, across a lot of our schools, but primarily at Chinook, Kennewick High, and Southridge, or where we see some great effort going on with that. And then with student placement, what I'm referring to there is that we're being really we're being a little bit more thoughtful when it comes to when we evaluate a student, where might we best suit their needs? So it wasn't too long ago that if a student had a diagnosis of, of, of autism, for example, our default setting was to say, well, they might need an autism program, but what about an autism program? We're trying to shift that mindset, and you remember mindset was on the OSPI di or diagram there, shift the mind mindset to say, what is the student's needs, not what is their disability category? because their student needs should drive where they get placed, not just the label that we attach to them. Um, so that's what I really talk about student placement. So we're looking for ways to include our students, even our most disabled students in general education PE classes and other elective classes at our high schools. Um, we're looking for ways to expand opportunities within the gen ed setting for English language arts and not have as many um, special education English language arts classes. And so that's what I mean when I'm referring to student placement. So it's really those three areas that we're really focusing on trying to improve that inclusion rate to our goal of having an inclusion rate above 58%. I'm going to let, turn it over now to Lexi to talk a little bit about behavior supports and the parent involvement component. I will say, though, that with the behavior supports, as, as we have heard um, numerous times, as we know, as we've experienced as staff, behavior is really the most challenging aspect sometimes of, of serving our students with disabilities. Um, behavior is a disability, and, and, and it can really it can really look a lot like a student just making a choice. It can really look like a lot like a student who is just deciding to misbehave. And when a student has a, has a behavioral disability, that's not the case. And we've had some struggles in terms of just how we can provide supports to that. And so I'm gonna have Lexi talk a little bit about what we're doing to address those needs um, for those students. So. So probably one of the biggest challenges taking over the department um, was addressing the behavior challenges that we've had district wide. Um, over the last few years, we were able to develop a tier two behavior program where we had kids come for a full day in programming where they were a part of a school and we were starting to address some of those vision things. We wanted kids to be out of school all day long. Um, and that is really helping. Um, those programs are thriving now. We're basing all of our decisions off of data. Our teachers are becoming very good at collecting data, making data-driven decisions, um, and helping us really define where we need to provide interventions for those kiddos. One of the things that we realized though is that we needed a team of people to go in and be able to provide support, both in those programs and out at all 30 of our um, schools within the district. Um, before taking over this position, I was a part of our intervention team. And this year, um, we also, another challenge, opportunity for growth. Um, at the end of the year last year, we found out that Lord's Children's Day program, which had historically provided services to um, a number of our students here in the Kennewick School District, um, was closing. And so we quickly went to the drawing board and tried to figure out how are we gonna meet these kids' needs. 
um, we decided that our best efforts was to expand our intervention team and be able to provide robust support to those kiddos um, and buildings, teachers, um, building administrators out in all 30 of our schools. What we did is we looked at um, our, we have a behavior specialist now, we have an educational specialist who focuses more on the instructional component, the IEP component. We have two dedicated mental health specialists, one that's an intensive mental health specialist, the other who um, is just a general mental health specialist that can go in and do more drop-in, check-ins with kids, and then our intensive individual who is providing really robust mental health supports um, and initially started off with those kiddos that were um, unfortunately displaced from Lourdes, but she's been able to expand her services. We carry a contract with Comprehensive Mental Health and we were fortunate enough to hire someone full-time who's been on staff with us since about November. Um, we have seven paraeducators now. I like to think of them as super paras. Um, uh, they go in, they help, they can go in as a helping set of hands. They go in and help model. Um, they can go in and help um, work alongside other paraeducators, problem solve, dialogue about how do we address the concerns that are um, being raised in this classroom. As the year went on this year, though, we realized that we still had an unmet need, and that unmet need was really middle school. Um, middle school, we have our tier two behavior program at the elementary level, and as I'm sure um, folks have heard, our kiddos go on to middle school and um, they're, they struggle initially. And so we were really trying to figure out how do we provide support and how do we create a vision and start some problem solving. One of the things that we were able to do is to get authorization to post for five additional. So in addition to the seven intervention team members, we um, have five positions posted. I've hired two of the five. Um, and we are gonna be placing those individuals out at our middle schools full time to be able to provide support, to be able to intervene, to problem solve with those teams, to be able to work with those kids, um, help them de-escalate, be the, a trusted person in the building, um, because we know that our staff right now is stretched really thin. So we are adding to that intervention team um, right now. Um, additionally, we um, are also <laughs> looking at the feasibility. Um, we have gone and taken to our leadership the idea of moving forward with a tier two behavior program um, at the middle school level. And so we're in the early phases of kind of assessing, is that something that's going to be feasible? And if so, where would that be? I think that that will be able to provide an additional layer of support if we're able to do that for some of our kids um, that are really struggling at that middle school level or that haven't quite reached the um, the level where they're able to graduate out of that tier two support. So those are forthcoming um, potential additional supports here in the future. Um, in addition to the behavior piece, one of the things I've really been um, trying to work on and um, my predecessor had left some really awesome plans for things that we were gonna do, um, a big event with our parents this year. And unfortunately, as COVID has done, it's disrupted a number of things, but we are back on track. Um, our special education parent advisory committee meets quarterly. And one of the things that we really are trying to do is working with our job alike groups, our teachers, and helping get the word out that we are looking for interested parents to join our committee. We wanna dialogue with families. We wanna know where the needs are, where are the successes? How can we help um, collaborate, problem solve with you? We know that changes are coming. We have a lot of graduation um, requirements that have been changing recently, and we want our families to be informed and understand that process. We also want them to feel connected to our community and our resources. So we are this spring planning um, some events with our high school families and our high school programs um, in collaboration with the ARC. Early next year, provided that COVID is settled down, we hope to have a special education resource fair um, in collaboration with um, a variety of our community providers. One of the things, and I can't remember what this slide, oh, yep, it is. So one of the things that you'll notice though is that we're really looking to expand our um, parent involvement in our special education parent action committee. Um, we don't have representation, representation from all of our tiers and we really want to expand that. And so one of the goals that we're really trying to work on right now is to reach those families that are interested in dialoguing with us. Every time a parent calls to 
to either share successes or talk about challenges, I always offer them the opportunity of joining our CPAC committee. So um, I just want to put the word out tonight that we are looking for interested families to join us and continue that dialogue. Um, so with that, those are the behavior and our parent involvement pieces. Do you guys have questions? Like I've been busy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, Gabe. I have two very quick questions. One, do we uh, provide? Um, <clears throat> I know there's collaboration between Gen Ed teachers and our and our resource te teachers, and um, do we provide any sort of training for our Gen Ed teachers on like PD for how to you know? If, I can only imagine coming into a be a teacher like first year, and maybe I've got tier two kids, or uh, you know, just learning how to monitor that or, or handle that. Do we provide that kind of training? Yes, so one of the things too that we are looking, I have a list of our ongoing PD reaching out to our buildings too, not just that have resources, but had, we have um, programs in all of our buildings offering PD. A lot of our principals will reach out early on and say, hey, I'd like to offer training to our staff and here's what I'd like it to target and focus on. So that's definitely something that we're already getting those requests for next year. Additionally, um, we were under a two-year um, grant for inclusionary practices pilot project, um, and it ended as Becca was leaving and I was coming in. And so um, we are going to pick that back up. Um, there is opportunities for us to access grant funding to provide additional um, professional development to not only work with our special education teachers, but work with our gen ed partners and work in collaboration to help build capacity to meet kids needs in all of our buildings. And so that's really another um, department goal for us is to explore that. I think this year it was learning where we are and where our opportunities for growth are. And, and then the last thing. Um, so you mentioned in, these kids are they're students first and, and whatnot. Yeah. Um, have we thought about how we're labeling them as tier two students and giving them that name? Like, is that something because I've heard it in schools where, oh, that's a two tier student. Like, so kids kind of know that perception. So we thought about addressing maybe how we're call, you know, what verbiage we're using with these students and you know we should just call them students but I, I know we have to have some dialogue there i suppose absolutely i mean i think that that is something that we are constantly aware of um and something that i'm hoping that we are dialoguing about at the building level um i attend our building our principals our middle school elementary middle school and high school principals meetings and i think that that's something that needs to be a conversation that occurs frequently not just a part of a one-time training but something that we are dialoguing about because as you know, I was talking with Matt before we came here today, you know, our kids may be in programs, but first and foremost, you know, I'll pick a school, Eamon Creek. They're Eamon Creek Otters. They're all Eamon Creek Otters. They're all students um, at that building. And so, and that's really how we want the building to um, accept those kids. And I think that there's more work that can be done for all of us just building the bridge. I think that historically, you know, education moves. Um, kind of used to operate in silos and some of it was just restrictions, but, uh, budgets, you know, we would operate here's basic ed and here's SPED. And now we're really able to braid funds and we're able to collaborate and dialogue. And so we need to start strengthening those partnerships. Great, thank you and congrats. On thank you, <laughs> I appreciate it. I just want to comment on that too, because I think that's really important in the words and how we speak about our students is critically important. And, uh, we just have, for whatever reason in education, we have a habit of of saying like a low income kid or a, a, where we, we lead with a label and 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 we're, we have these conversations when it comes up, but we need to figure out how to be more sort of overt about it and say we, and, and that's something I've been thinking about too, not just with special education, but in all areas. It's important how we refer to our students and our families. Yeah, yeah um, so I was curious at the really the secondary level, how uh, if discussions are had with groups like ASB, leadership classes and whatnot, and how we're messaging it from the student level, um, you know, to promote inclusivity in, in that regard and if those discussions take place or. That's a great question and definitely something I would definitely follow up on. I know at some of our buildings, all of our high school buildings, I partner with the Arc of the Tri-Cities 
who provides our buddy club. Um, and so a lot of that focus at the secondary level is around our buddy club participation. And I know that some of our high schools have really robust, um, uh, really strong buddy club support. But I think even expanding beyond that, because you know, I, I think there's even more that we can do. And so I'm just, my wheels are spinning now with the feedback. And so I appreciate, I appreciate your guys' questions and feedback. Thank you. Yes. Yes, Micah. My, so I, one thing I just love that you said, and I just wish that every principal said the exact same thing, is that you're trying to get parents in the schools. And I just, I love that. And I'm really glad that you're doing that. I'm grateful. And I think that that would be a big, um, solve a lot of problems. I wish that as a school district, uh, I hope that we could actually talk about that sometime, about how we can get more parents in schools and more parents involved. I mean, we have a lot of parents who want to be involved and we have a, a lack of teachers, right? And we, we hear it, we have a lack of it. So, but we have parents. So like, can we, can we bridge that gap? So uh, the fact that you're asking, you know, I, I just, I, I really like that and I encourage you to do that. And I, I, I would like to actually talk about that too. Thank you. Welcome. I just, and, and, you know, a shout out to the team that works alongside me because we've done two whole staff trainings um, in, in an effort to lay the groundwork for moving forward with our inclusionary practices, part of that begins with our IEP process. And we've provided two full, well, two hours of training, once last, one hour last month and one this month, about how we include parent voice in our IEPs. Um, we want to move away from drafting an IEP that's written by a teacher and then provided to a family. And how do we dialogue? It's a two-way dialogue and we want parents' voice. We want kids' voices as a part of that IEP. So I think that there's some great work being done by our special education department. So I just wanted to shout out to our team because we're asking people to stretch their skills. <laughs> I was just going to follow up. Yeah, I was just going to follow up that uh, uh, Buddy Club is absolutely amazing and it is supported very, very well by this district and the co-leader at Kennewick and all of our high schools have had um, quite a bit of success this year. And so I just I want to say that's a, an amazing program and I'm really proud that we have that in our schools. So thank you. Very welcome. Thank you for being a part of that. I know that it brings so much value, happiness, and I just, it's a great program. So thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Appreciate the presentation. Thanks. Oh, nice thank you. you. Okay, next on our agenda is new business. Uh, policy 5321 personnel, family and medical leave. First reading. Mr. Christensen is going to come present. Good evening. Hello. Thanks for hanging Hello. in there. <laughs> no problem. A uh, couple policy revisions here tonight that we want to propose to the board for the review um, around the area of uh, employee leaves. These are existing policies that we've had for a long time and, and there's just been some updates. And we just want to catch up the policy with some of, we've, we've updated our practices and we need to update the policy to match those practices. So. First, I think 5321 is the one we're talking about first. Is that right? Yes, 5321. I have that right here. I'm looking at something. Okay. Okay. So this is around um, family medical leaves. And so anything that's you know, crossed out or in red is new proposed language uh, that our team has looked at in human resources. The Family Medical Leave Act, commonly known as FMLA, has been around forever. It's a federal, it's a federal act, but the state of Washington has has some of their own statewide leave opportunities for employees. That's called paid family and medical leave. And so we want to separate that out so it's different. And so the, the policy reflects what's going on. So up above in the FMLA Act, the Federal Act, really just we need to add some new language. Um, this is consistent with WASDA recommendation language around how that leave is carried out. Typically, you'll see in the red there, it's done consecutively. An example would be maybe somebody going out on maternity leave for 12 weeks, that's kind of all in a row. But there are options for intermittent type leaves at times, depending on the medical condition or on the 
on the particular employee groups contracts. We just wanted to specify in there so it matches up the practice that we've been doing. Down below, and this is just germane to Washington State, um, the Paid Family and Medical Leave Act in Washington State that came into play is much different. It's not something that we administer or supervise. It's something the state offers and employees basically step away from us on an unpaid leave and then they access that and those uh, you know parameters around how they qualify, what they're paid, how long it lasts. And so we really wanted that in the policy to sort of show our employees that, you know, this is where you go for that kind of a thing. Up above is what we administer and carry out. So those are the really the language proposals that would match up with current practice. And so I just, you know, if you have any questions, that this is what you know, we have leave specialists that work in human resources. We're a big organization, so we actually have an employee that spends pretty much full time just dealing with leaves. And so between her and I and other members of our team, this is uh, what we bring to you tonight. Does anyone have any questions on the proposed changes? I would entertain a motion to accept. I'll move to approve policy 5321 for first and second reading. I'll second it. First and second, any questions, comments? I'll call for the roll call vote. Mr. Galbraith? Yes. Mr. Valentine? Yes. Ms. Sunvik? Yes. Mr. Mabry? Yes. Mr. Connors? Yes. Thank you. Okay, next on the agenda is policy 5324 on personnel military leave first reading. Thank you. Very similar to before, there's been some new changes. The military leave policy has been around for a long time. Uh, if you look at its inception there at the bottom, 1992. Been in recent uh, legislative at both state and sort of national uh, levels. There's been some changes. Uh, basically what this leave says is if somebody's been called up to military leave, you know, they have some rights that, uh, with the organization in terms of they're able to go out on unpaid leave for so many days, so many years, they can get their job back as long as it doesn't exceed five years. Um, and so there's just some different new pieces that go with this leave that we need to we need to put in there. There's also a new section about, you know, if somebody's called up that the spouse, if the spouses are employed, they can have some time to be with that, be with their spouse before they're deployed, or if they're on a, a break from a deployment, there's some time there too. None of these types of leaves are are paid leaves for this, but really as employers are saying, you can go have some unpaid time and you're not gonna lose your job or your rights to a job for those types of things. So that's really the, the synopsis of what this leave is about, is that we offer people time. Does this go so, towards their other paid, their, their other leave, right? Uh, like the one we just talked about? FML. Yeah. No, it's kind of totally separate. separate. So you, totally can get, separate. you can in theory get these 50, 21 days and then get. Uh, no, not typically. Those other leaves usually are that we talked about previously center on medical conditions and, and some specific things around that type of a leave. I suppose if somebody was, you know, had a medical condition, was on a leave and then got deployed all of a sudden that they might, you know, both be in play. But for the most part, they're separate separate types of issues. Yes, Diane. Does this affect a seniority, hiring seniority? I know they get their job back, but how does how does that work? So, you know, 21 days or something short term like that wouldn't. If somebody was deployed for three years, there's other language and other in the actual contracts of those employees that talk about getting the same or similar job back. Um, and so that's just kind of on a case by case basis, depending on the length, right. what that particular employee contract spells out. Because I know there's Representative Levitt is working on something toward that so that there's no loss of seniority time during yeah. that. So yeah. I'm sure you guys get all that. Yeah, so on a, a typical, let's say a maternity leave always comes right back right. to the same job. Um, seniority isn't affected. Sometimes when people go out on year long or two year long unpaid leaves, then that language in the contract comes into play of, you know, you have your job back, a similar job. You would still have the seniority that you had starting, but remember on unpaid leaves, people aren't getting like 
retirement or service credits. So Thanks. I think that's what you meant. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? I would entertain a motion. I move that we accept policy 5324, military leave for first and second reading. I second. First and second, any more conversation or questions? If not, I will call for the roll call vote. Mr. Galbraith? Yes. Mr. Valentine? Yes. Ms. Sundbeck? Yes. Mr. Mabry? Yes. Mr. Connors? Yes. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Doug. Okay, that concludes new business. Uh, next on the agenda, we're looking for uh, talking about the next meeting agenda. So we have the 21-22 budget update, capital projects update for Ridgeview. Uh, we're also going to discuss our proclamation or our uh, resolution here regarding uh, vaccine. Uh, yes. The other thing that will potentially need to be uh, <laughs> on the agenda is kind of pending the outcome, final outcome of the election. Um, we need to put, have, you know, put some time frame together. Have the board needs to convene and have a, a discussion. So I just it, there might be some impacts to this upcoming agenda depending on where we are. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. And then in the future, could we have a discussion about? Um, Parents and schools. We get that on the. I mean, it does not be next one, but one maybe the after that, but soon. We can certainly do that. Thank you. Yes, yes uh, I just uh, we do have um, one of our strategic goals is focused on parents, and so um, as a part of that, when we do that, I'm probably going to bring back some of the data from the family survey, parent survey that we did in uh, spring of last year. So we do an annual family survey and then use that to help focus on where are our strengths and where are our opportunities for growth. So I think that would be great because the last presentation we did on uh, parent involvement and engagement was in August. And so y'all didn't get to see it. So I just want to say that with the board because some of it will we'll take some of what was there and then add some updates and board discussion and so forth. Wonderful. OK, with no more business before the board, we're going to go into executive session for approximately 30 Fif minutes. 15. 15. I was going to say, I was going to shorten it up because we're all really tired. So it's, it's going to be, we're going to power through it. Uh, but at that time, I will come back and uh, adjourn the meeting. Thank you very much. Yes, there will be no more business. That's correct. Thank you. I know. I'm learning.